Sanchevo is one of the most desirable destinations in the world. A beautiful resort on the Costa Smeralda, the glittering coast of northern Sardinia. It's not hard to see why the venue continues to attract sailors every summer to compete on these beautiful blue waters. Holding pride of place in the harbour is the yacht club Costa Smeralda, the prestigious club established by the Aga Khan more than half a century ago. Everything you need to create the perfect regatta, it's right here, which is why the Sailing Champions League loves coming back year after year to Portocevo. We're on the morning of the penultimate day of the Sailing Champions League qualifier in Porto Cervo. My name's Andy Rice and flying in to join me is Mark Corky Rhodes. Um, so Corky, we have got a corker of a competition coming up. We've had two days of racing already and uh, today is the first day that we actually go live on the commentary. It all wraps up um, on Sunday afternoon. We've had good breeze on day one softer breeze on day two and uh, we're looking at uh, probably fairly soft breeze for the racing today aren't we yeah today it's a, it's a bit of a mixed bag where you can see through the camera a little bit more is there is a bit more cloud cover around normally it's crystal clear blue skies we've got a bit of cloud cover looking out in the bay there's a potentially a bit of rain on the outskirts and that's starting to to play a, a little bit of a difference with the the wind that we're going to have and so the sailors I think and this is exactly why they come here it, it's one a beautiful place to sail but it's, it's different conditions it's going to test the sailors it's going to not just bring out the people that sail in strong breeze it's not going to be the ones that sail in light breeze it has been a full mixed bag and and that will bring the the cream of the crop to the top and so we'll, we'll wait and see what uh, happens at the end of today there are a couple of teams that are a little stand out from the rest. One of the Swiss teams and also the Italians who won in San Moritz at the finals last year. Circolo della Vela Bari, they had a fantastic day yesterday. But they did get an OCS um, in one race. They were pulled out of a race at the Wimbledon Mark after they were leading um, in, in the early stages of, of that race. But they were just over early on the line. But they're, they're still lying in second place even after that. So the Italians, even though they haven't raced in a J70 since August last year in Samaritz, they're, they're right back on top of their game again, if they can avoid those small errors, which often make the, the, the difference. Well, and, and that's, that is the amazing thing about this format, is there are no discards whatsoever. So if this is the first time you're watching, or you may be a regular avid watcher of the same Champions League, not having a discard, the pressure's huge, you know? It's sort of back-to-back -back races, everyone has a little slip up now and again and they that OCS okay it's nudged them down to second but we know that later in the week when the points really matters that could actually start to affect them and could see them not step on that top spot so it's going to be very interesting but one little slip up from each of these teams that could be uh, their championship over yes although bearing in mind um it depends on your sort of uh, what your approach is for this regatta it would be lovely to win it but um also for a lot of these guys the the aim is to get one of those top seven places that guarantees you a spot in the final in in Samaritz. so so they were fairly relaxed about the fact they got the ocs when they got the ocs it, it did drop them down to about seventh or so at the time so they were on the cusp but then they came right back with a with a run of really good scores later on in the afternoon um but it does go to show all the tiny little margins count it's worth pushing for the line to to have your nose poked out on the boats ahead of you provided of course you don't break across the line and and it's so intense i mean some of the racing i saw i went out yesterday on the matilda boat the uh, the boat that the sailors hang out on when they're not racing and they they get looked after really nicely out there it has to be said and you, you get good grandstand view of the racing i mean you you see leads perish in in just one slightly poor jibe where you get a bit of an hourglass in the Jenica and suddenly your lead i saw it happen yesterday for the for the club from cascais they, they drop from first down to seventh in the space of one run just because of a little bit of an hourglass so all those small boat handling errors can really add up to quite disastrous results on the race course yeah and and, and that's it these teams trying to put the time in and uh are trying to make sure that everything's set boat handling is key the boats are all the same you're set up, the race course is the same, you're against the same people, you know, it's all going to come down to boat handling, having a correct strategy and playing it out. Well, let's see who comes out on top on day three. Corky and I are going to be all over it today, so uh, we're looking forward to getting into the racing on day three.
Uh, on behalf of the Yacht Club Bacos Esmeralda, uh, I would like to welcome uh, all of uh, the participants uh, to the One Ocean uh, uh, Sailing Champions League 2019. Well, I just got down from the roof of Yacht Club Costa Smeralda. I took the stairs, but Corky, you took the lift. Why do you take the lift? Well, uh, slight injury to the back, and uh, hence why I was stood looking like I had a board strapped to my back in that sort of uh, chat there. But uh, we're doing all right, feeling better. Feel like you're looking after me, which is the main thing. So We'll, we'll keep Corky dosed up. I, I can't do without him, so uh, hopefully he'll make it through the day. Um, uh, but meanwhile, even working even harder than Corky are, of course, the sailors out there on the water here for day three of the Sailing Champions League qualifier. I should say the One Ocean Sailing Champions League qualifier. Um, we'll get on to what, why, uh, what and why One Ocean Foundation is a little bit later on, an important part of the competition this time round. I think this is the, uh, what, the fourth year that Sailing Champions League has been uh, coming to Portocevo, and uh, you can always see why when you come back here, can't you? Oh, it's it's an amazing place. Um, I say, I think all the, the locals seem a little bit confused by this cloud and mist rolling in. It's something they don't really get to see. As I say, the pictures there just tell the, uh, the story of that crystal blue sky, the turquoise waters, and uh, why wouldn't you want to come? We, we always refer to it as champagne sailing all the time, bit of breeze, bit of sunshine, and, and that's exactly what the sailors have had. But again, the hospitality and support um, from the club is, is amazing. And um, again, what a, what a backdrop for these sailors. But uh, when you've got the welcome they have, the racing, the race course to, uh, to be on, then, um, yeah, it's a pretty special place and you're going to continue to come back. Yeah, but it is strange weather at the moment in Europe, isn't it? I mean, as I flew over, um, over the mountains from Stuttgart, where we change planes from London Heathrow, there's still a lot of snow on the mountains and apparently that you can still go skiing um, for free in some of the, uh, the resorts around Europe because it's, it's been a really strange cold spring that we've had. And um, we often ask the question, um, why don't we come to Portocevo earlier? I mean, we're in late May and the place is only just opening up for business. But it's actually still not that warm here yet, not, not compared with what we're used to. And that seems to be affecting the weather systems and therefore the breeze that, uh, that we've got to contend with this week as well. No, it's, it's uh, a combination of, of, of the weather is, is a huge thing. We're noticing at so many events where they're guaranteed wind, go here and, and so on. And we're starting to see very different weather patterns starting to appear at, at different venues. And, you know, I, I think sort of uh, with the, the One Ocean Foundation and lots of things, there's some fairly pressing points to um, which I say will hammer in a little bit harder of what we've got to do. But um it, it, it is a strange place going from all these uh, dedicated slots where you expect there to be breeze. Um, we are getting slightly different weather patterns than you say, skiing during the middle of sort of spring and summer, then it's a um, strange bit. But uh, One place that did get the, exactly what was predicted and, and what they said would be on the tin, it was on the tin, it was in Parma for the previous qualifier um, in the Sailing Champions League. That was qualifier one. And I wish we'd have been there because looking at the pictures, it looked like they had absolutely fantastic breeze. So um, we're going to see a, a recap of what happened in Parma and who won as well. Norddeutsche Regatta Verein from Germany took advantage of sensational sailing conditions in Parma de Mallorca to win the first of three qualifiers in the Sailing Champions League. It was the first time the Sailing Champions League has visited this beautiful Mediterranean island and after enjoying stellar racing conditions at the regatta hosted by Club Nautique Arenal, the 26 crews from 16 nations will be hoping to come back here in future years. The top eight finishers have secured a place at the grand final in San Moritz later this summer. WSV Almir Central, Brando Seglar, Société Nautique de Genève, Club Nautique de Versoix, 
Friedrichshaven Style Club, Kalovic Badelau, Kongelik Dance Your Club, No Deutsche Regatta Verein. So No Deutsche Regatta Verein, they're a familiar name in a league competition. They've won the German League many times and no doubt having won uh, the first qualifier of three this season, uh, Norddeutsche Regatta Verein will be one of the leading contenders for the finals that we're going to be commentating on in San Moritz in late August, Corky. Looking forward to going back there. Yeah, it's, again, um, what, a, what an amazing place. Sort of all of the actual league stopovers, the qualifiers through to the final, all providing very, very different conditions. And um, yeah, we saw very different conditions there last year. Hopefully we won't have as much rain and snow and and that we had last time but um again it very different conditions for all of the sailors so you kind of settle into something and and this is what makes the the same champions league such a unique setup you know the j70s run throughout uh, the qualifiers through to the final so about the teams getting settled in of course the uh, the leagues all running in their own countries um but to finish out in well to come out here and st petersburg and palmer as a qualifiers but to finish in san moritz it's a, a pretty special finish place yeah amazing places to go um neither of us made it to parma but uh here we are both in portachevo and then you have the honor of going to st petersburg for the third and final qualifier uh, so you'll be going to russia for your first time is it first time sort of uh i say sort of um should have gone last sort of few years but other conflicts with bits have uh, stopped that but yeah looking forward to again just seeing the setup it's been there several times now um Lots of other events have been run there. And again, uh, a different setup to what they have here and a, a different, not open to the sea, more closed in. Um, and again, the race course creates its completely own sort of strategy. Uh, the, the river Neva really does flow quite strongly there as well. Um, so the, the current has a massive effect on the racing, which obviously is some, something you're not going to have to contend with in the finals in San Moritz. Anyway... Instead of us blathering on about these wonderful places, let's take you have a look at them for yourselves. The best part is the high level at this Champions League because always action. It can be also frustrating sometimes if you are behind, but uh, I think just if you have uh, the opportunity to sail in this high level, you can progress. It's a really close racing, it's uh, right on the shore, there's a lot of things happening, so there are a lot of chances to win. Aren't we lucky boys being able to go to places like that? And so are these sailors. Um, Porto Cervo, meanwhile, we've got 24 teams representing 16 nations. You and I, as Brits who can't speak any other language, is going to have an awful lot of fun trying to pronounce the, the names of these clubs. So, uh, again, rather than us try and uh, tell you what these clubs are, it might be better if you read the names for yourself.
So those are our 24 teams from 16 nations. Let's take you out onto the water, out to the race area. And uh, we've got a third commentator out there, Hinek Ziemsen, um, who is a great sailor in his own right. He knows what he's looking at. And Hinek hopefully will be able to give us some insight into what conditions actually feel like out on the water. Corky, earlier today, you and I, we've been here to Portachova many times. We, we saw fog rolling through and, and the waitress was, oh, we, I think we, maybe we've got Hinnock coming up very soon. So let's go to Hinnock now, actually. Hi, Hinnock. Yes, uh, we, hi, hi, Andy. Uh, yeah, we have some nice breeze out here. We have some nice sun, the rain left, and uh, we got some nice sailing condition here in Portachova. Uh, we saw already some action on the water, a black flag, some, the yellow boat was disqualified and yeah, had to leave the race because of the situation at the start. And we're just sailing with seven boats now. But wow. we have some nice swell here, we have tight racing. And Hinnock, any idea why that black flag was given to the yellow boat? Uh, it was, uh, they didn't do the, the uh, penalty turn and uh, didn't accept it and the umpire said, okay, then you're disqualified for now. But I guess there will be some discussion later about it. And do you think that uh, they knew that they needed to take the penalty and they just refused to take it? Yes, that's what I saw. And uh, at the top mark, the umpire said, yeah, it's over for you now. But and I guess, yeah, later there will be much more discussion. And from the drone shot, just behind you actually, if you look over your shoulder, is that the boat that you're talking about? Look behind you. Is, is, that, is that the boat we're talking uh, about? Ah, no. Or maybe no, it's... the yellow boat is already down at the starting vessel. Okay, I think we see it from another shot. Is it uh, boat number three? It looks more like a green sail than a yellow sail. Yes, but it... yes no. Yeah, it's boat number three, the yellow sail, yes. They're already okay. down and uh, we are at the top mark now. So I, I, if we can identify who that is, we will, we will do our best. Uh, we've got the flag on the back of the, uh, on the backstay, which someone is just adjusting now. Um, but Hinnock, what, what uh, kind of wind strength do you have out there at the moment? Um, we got some nice breeze, I'd say eight to ten knots. Um, we got some light swell coming in from outside and the sailors are yeah quite fast the course got longer than yesterday and we got some yeah some nice sets some nice hoists big maneuvers and the uh, field is really close together no big gaps tight racing okay Hinnock, well uh, we look forward to coming back to you a few times later on today and if you can put us in touch with some of the sailors maybe winners of individual races that would be great as well so it's good to have you out there, and it uh, looks like you're enjoying the weather out there. Thanks, Hinnock. Yes. Back to Thank you a little you bit much, later. Andy. See you later. So you can see someone out there with a very big lead in the distance. Um, and we're seeing this pattern quite often, uh, Corky. Um, someone who, who manages to, to, to get a lead seems to be able to stretch that, whilst the pack seem to keep each other occupied and just make life easier and easier. And... Um, who is that boat that we see in the lead? Uh, so that is the Italian team, Cerclo della Vallabari, with that lead. And it's, it's one of those ones where because the boats are one design and that you can easily get drawn back into the pack, if, if you can give yourself that little bit of breathing space, get to the front of the fleet, actually you're able to sell your strategy. You're able to get that bit of clear air. You can suddenly see how tightly packed four or five boats are, even the second boat, just giving a bit of breathing space away from that. But... As soon as you in enter sort of that pack situation and it closes in, then obviously the speed differences are, are so minor that actually trying to, to force any gaps all come down to the turning marks. It's about putting yourself on that inside line, giving yourself the opportunity to, to be able to claim that room at the mark. If it's just straight line speed, there's generally not a massive difference between the boats unless someone's found that uh, little magic key for the boats. Again, as we saw just from that drone shot, the teams all rotate around us. As you were saying yesterday, uh, sorry, earlier today was you were on Matilda, the team boat, which is a big catamaran where all the teams, they just climb on, they get their flags, they jump onto the boat. So that all the boats have to be identical. They all jump on, swap their flags and off they go. So there is no tuning, tweaking it. It's just setting the boat 
as early as possible as uh, Chocolo Della Vellabari cross the line and take that, as I say, extended lead. But it doesn't matter really how far you win. It all comes down to the same points. Uh, meanwhile, another top performing team so far in Portocevo over the last couple of days. It's the Swiss team. Segla Varenigan Kreuzlingen, I'm sorry about the mashed pronunciation there. Um, and then a much tighter race for third place. Another Swiss team, Regatta Club Bodensee, coming across. There are series leaders at the moment, coming across in third, followed by Pogon Zhezin uh, from Poland. That's, Poland. that's a good result for them. Wessex Exiles from Great Britain, Saro Boat Club from Sweden, Odyssey Sailing Club, also the other Polish team. So two po Polish teams still about to come across the finish in seventh place. But we should remember, not last, because Yacht Club Breitenbrunn from Austria were already pulled out of the race after that controversial black flag penalty that was put upon them by the jury who don't like being defied. No one, uh, in the end, you go up against the jury, the jury's always going to win. As the clash said, I have fought the law, but the law won. It's, it's very much that is that if they feel they've uh, imposed a penalty, yep, they'll discuss it. But you're always better off just taking that penalty, getting it done and then discussing it later by taking the bold stance they have um, has kind of forced a bit of a position and whether they're going to dig themselves out that hole or not. But um, two of those uh, boats that we saw, the top three boats, uh, uh, Chocolo della Vallabari, um, after crossing that line and winning that, uh, keep themselves firmly in second place, just two points off Regatting Club at Bodensee, uh, the Swiss team that we saw finish third there. So in that flight that we've just uh, finished up, that was flight number 11 and the third race in that flight. Um, and so after that, those two clubs sit at the top spot. So we're just capturing those uh, last bits. But again, I, I think... You know, we, we mentioned it earlier when we were on, uh, at the top of the club and just chatting about it is that there are no discards. So, again, let's just look at uh, Yacht Club uh, Breton Brun then from that sort of uh, section of playing hardball with the, the umpires. <coughs> That's, um, it's a bold move considering, you know, that, what, that one sort of uh, disqualification at the moment has pushed him down to ninth and um, that puts us in a, a tricky position. I, I wonder if we're being a little bit too hard on them based on maybe not enough facts. I'm seeing down on the results that they're scored as OCS. So before we're a little bit too judgmental on Yacht Club, Brighton Brun from Austria, I just wonder if they started early, um, they didn't know it. Um, otherwise, you would go back and you'd restart. Um, they, they got to the top mark and maybe they were pulled out of the race. Um, and if they would... I want, well, there was a black flag given. I'm not sure if the black flag is flown for those kind of situations, but certainly as we're seeing on the scoring, um, it's recording them as OCS. So we may not know the full detail of that until later on in the day. Um, either way, an OCS with eight boats here, an OCS is worth nine points. So you carry that extra point that you would have done compared with, say, finishing last in the race. Um, but Cecolo della Vellabari, they just won the race that we saw just now. They got an OCS yesterday. They were pulled out of the Wimmer Mark whilst they were in the lead of um, Flight 6. Um, so you see in, uh, in second place, you see that OCS for Cecolo della Vellabari from Italy. But they're on 26 points, and now they're only two points behind Regatta Club Bodense, who got a third place in the race just now. So Regatta Club Bodense being the most consistent performer, but if you were to take that OCS out and give, let's be generous, and give that first place back to the Italians, because probably once they got in the lead, they would have stayed in the lead, that, that's another eight points they could have taken off their total. So they would now be on 18 points, and they would be leading this series very comfortably. So I suppose, Corky, from uh, yours and my perspective, and, and from any neutrals watching online we should be grateful for that OCS and and the fact the Italians did have that rare mistake it's really opened up the competition a lot more yeah very much so and this is what I think is great about this format is not having um, a discard it means that every single race counts we you know with the number of flights that you've got going on is that at some point you're potentially going to slip up. It might be a, a slip up as an OCS, for instance, and pushing the start line. You know, I was always told growing up with sailing is that, you know, if you didn't get an OCS in your regatta, you weren't pushing the start line hard enough. And, well, 
you know, there's pushing it and there's uh, certainly with the penalty and impacting. And as r rightly so, is if they didn't have that, then, yeah, there would be leaps and bounds in front, which uh, so makes a, a lot more interesting. But again, uh, Regatta Club Bodensey, when they started this uh, this event, uh, finished up with a fifth in the first uh, race. So again, it's uh, it, it keeps everything tightly packed and makes uh, everything sort of um, all tick along quite nicely. But um, again, keeps the pressure on all the sailors every single race matters there's no we can just coast through this one a little bit and and hope's all right um of course this is the qualification so you know when it comes to uh sam moritz then obviously it all sits a little bit harder and uh more pressured because there's only one spot you want to be coming away with when here this is a qualification for that final uh, just halfway through the leaderboard and then down to the bottom of the leaderboard so the the two polish teams i'm afraid sitting at the bottom of this scoreboard at the moment, um, which goes to show fourth place in that last race uh, for Pogon was a good score for them. Um, and uh, they're going to need to get a few more mid fleets. And, and if they could, one of the Polish teams could win a race, that would be fantastic for them. But the, the great thing about these events is you, you, you get to sail with some of the best in, in Europe and probably the best in the world. And, and that's the way that uh, teams like the Poles are going to learn. Um, so we referred to this qualifier as the One Ocean Sailing Champions League qualifier. Um, so the One Ocean Foundation is a, is a fairly uh, new organization. Let's find out a little bit more about what they're aiming to achieve. From the start, we've been saying it clearly. We have to act to protect the ocean because human life depends on it. You are never too young to make a difference. More and more people are becoming aware of how much we can do when working together, adopting behavior to defend the environment. That's why we are spreading the ocean literacy, understanding the influence that the ocean has on us and how we affect the ocean is the first step to making a difference. Because in reality, we look at the sea without seeing it. We are not concerned about what is happening underneath the waves because those problems are out of our sight. But those are the things that are seriously changing the possibilities of life on Earth. It's the accumulation of many pollutants and plastic waste. Acidification. It's the rising temperature. It's the reduction of marine habitats and biodiversity. The ocean and human beings are inextricably intertwined, but this doesn't seem to matter. The ocean also provides livelihoods for more than 3 billion people and has a huge economic value. If it were a nation, it would be the seventh largest economy in the world. We are ocean defenders young but very determined to act, to deal with the emergency and really change the future of the planet. Every day we commit to communicating, educating, raising awareness through sports, promoting scientific research. Carta Esmeralda is our code of ethics. We promote it to spread the commitment to protect the marine ecosystem in every activity. Only a change in each individual's behavior leads to a whole change. The knowledge of the problem leads to the awareness of wanting to change. We don't want our children to ask us in the future why we didn't do anything while we still had time. Today, although the time we have for change is running out, together we can meet this challenge. Well, something that any of us sailors would care about, um, the One Ocean Foundation, organized by the Yacht Club Costa Smeralda and with the support of Audi as the main partner. Uh, it was only created in March last year. And uh, it's got the backing of Princess Zara Aga Khan as president and the Commodore of Yacht Club Costa Smeralda, Ricardo Bonadeo, as vice president. And it's to bring much greater awareness that we really need to work harder to preserve the marine environment. Easy from the drone shot here to think all is well beneath the water. 
Um, but uh, anything that we can do, including uh, we've been issued, Corky and I, with some uh, reuse reusable water bo bottles. But uh, we do that already, don't we, Corky? Yeah, very much so. It's, uh, it's a very simple thing that everybody can do. You know, get a, a water bottle that you reuse, you carry with you all the time, whether it's in your backpack, when you're traveling, whether it's in your car, whatever. It's very simple. Don't just go reaching straight for into a shop and find a, a buy a plastic bottle because as soon as you drink it, where's it go? Straight in the bin. And so, uh, we, yeah. we, could, we could moan about how hard it is to refill those water bottles at various airports around the world, but we'll get into that a little bit later on um, because we've got just a, a minute to the start. This is the start of Flight 12, and uh, we are on board with the British team uh, Wessex Exiles. So uh, four young blokes from Great Britain. Uh, looking to uh, cause a bit of an upset with some of the more experienced teams. And uh, the Exiles are on the cusp of um, that sort of seven, um, the top seven qualifying. I think they're in about 11th or 12th place overall at the moment. Uh, but the points are close enough that they could stand a chance. So we've got just 30 seconds to go. And on board with one of the Polish teams, this is Odyssey Sailing Club, one of the two teams at the bottom of the scoreboard. So... Uh, let's see their approach into the line. 18 seconds to go. Corky, where would you want to be on the start line? Well, interesting. I, I'd, I'd definitely want to be more down towards this pin end. So uh, boat number four and eight are in a, a fairly solid place because the breeze just clicking towards into a left phase as well as a little bit more breeze on that. But you can see the biasness on that line. Big duck down late on in there. So uh, surprised they've done that because that scrubbed a lot of speed. So... Uh, boat number eight there, just coming away with a, a really nice position. Yacht Club uh, Breton Brun. Um, so after picking up that uh, black flag or OCS is uh, still to be decided, but black flag obviously is that OCS. They've uh, come out with a nice strong position. The tricky thing about pinning yourself towards this side is now they have no opportunity to tack. It's about breaking clear, being able to just... Uh, lose that boat up to windward of you for when that first shift comes in. They are short courses, and so the last thing you want to do is be pinned to one side. The breeze at the moment, though, we've got about 11, 11 knots of breeze, staying fairly steady, so really lovely condition for the J70s here. Um, and about four, five uh, degrees of difference across that race course, so generally a fairly steady course. Uh, but you can see them just... Good speed and breaking clear now, and uh, hopefully that would give them the opportunity to uh, get that tack in. I would certainly be looking to potentially get a tack in sooner rather than later and bank that position rather than uh, pin themselves too much further to that left side. You would think so. Um, we're looking at Societe de Regat du Havre, which I, I thought was lining up for a really good pin and start, and then they, they, they panicked a little bit at the end. They, there was a lot of handbrake turning. They thought they were going to be over early. I don't think they would have been. And uh, they really gave away a fantastic position at the start, and now they have no control in terms of where they are. They're going to have to wait uh, the boat nearest to picture for the other boat, boat eight, uh, to tack, which they've now done. That's Yacht Club Brightonbrun. Now, as I said that about the, uh, the French, will they get across? This is absolutely critical for the French that they cross, and it looks like they will do. So things are looking up for Société de Regat du Havre. And now the question for them is, will they have room when they get to the top to be able to, to tack when they want to tack, or will they be dictated to by some of the other boats already on starboard? But uh, having been a little bit tough on uh, Le Havre, it looks like Le Havre on the left-hand side of screen, uh, currently, normally, according to the tracker, are our race leaders uh, with Yacht Club Breitenbrunn from Austrian, Austria just off uh, to their right-hand side. So the two boats that we see closest to picture now uh, vying for the front of this fleet. And also the Polish from Pogon. Uh, we don't expect much from them because they are one of the two back teams overall in the, in the scoreboard, but at the moment holding third place in this race. So not too shabby from the Polish crew either. Yeah, I'm really, just really surprised that sort of um, the the boat's down at that pin end. You know, you've got a fixed point. You've got that pin end mark to give you that real sense of, I know exactly where I am on this start line. And that late last minute handbrake turn to uh, to drop them down. Yeah, it has created that little bit of an, an opportunity to open up. But as I said, I, I think that picks up on that left-hand shift. The problem is now as they approach this windward mark, 
if they are lined up with any of these boats that have taken that tack slightly earlier into that shift, they're all going to be approaching on that starboard lay line, starboard turn, and it's going to all start to get a little bit messy at that windward mark for them. So uh, at the moment, they've uh, looked like they've got a bit of breathing space, but again, a couple of, uh, you know, creeping in, obviously, uh, maybe a little bit of nerves and, and so on from that start. Coming out of that tack, trying to go high straight away into a high mode and uh, losing and scrubbing a bit of pace. But um, your club, uh, Bruton Brun, at the front there are going to have clear space to escape. And again, this is what we saw in that last one uh, with the Italians just escaping at the front, having that bit of breathing space. So as long as they can keep their boat handling slick, this could, uh, could be a nice uh, solid result for them. Now, I wonder if the Austrians are thinking as they go around the marking first, are, are the jury going to come and have a word or did we get away with that? Was that a good start? No one's come and told them to get off the line yet. And beautiful hoist there uh, for the Austrians. So Christian Binder and his team well away. And uh, then round in uh, second place is boat number six. That's Saro Boat Club from Sweden. And it's very, very tight in the middle to the back of the pack. A red flag appearing on the umpire's boat, and I wouldn't be surprised if that wasn't uh, for the French uh, team just trying to squeeze in. It looked like there was a, a small shunt and a, a spin there, so we see boat number three. So just trying to um, identify. Let, let's see what Hinnock knows. So if Hinnock can hear us out on the water... Uh, what observations do you have of the race so far? It looks like we've got two penalties and we've got one boat in all kinds of trouble. If we go back to the, to the, uh, to the boat at the back, it's really struggling with its spinnaker at the moment. Yeah, um, we see some, yeah, two penalties. Boat number seven, boat number three. Boat number three tried to do the penalty with the Jenica up, which was probably not a good idea, but they are starting to stabilize now, but are both in last and second last place now. Yeah, it was a little tight at the top mark, and the umpire said, yeah, two penalties for those guys. And uh, if you look over your shoulder, tell us the, about the two boats that you see at the front of the fleet. Um, yeah, it's the Swedish boat and uh, the Jaklo Breitenbrunn. And uh, Jaklo Breitenbrunn just jumped away. And yeah, the Swedes following, trying to attack again, because we are almost laying the gate now, and it's going to be... A tight rounding between Brighton Brown and the Swedish. Henrik, thanks very much. We'll get back to you a little bit later on. Um, but Thank we you. saw some disastrous penalties yeah. there from the two boats at, at the back now. Um, but meanwhile, the Austrians, who I thought had quite a healthy lead as they went round the mark, are really being attacked by the Swedes from Saro Boat Club. Well, exactly. That is that sort of that jibe in early. And this is where sort of not only your boat handling's got to be slick and keep up that manoeuvre loss and just keeping the speed through and your angles right. Um, positioning and where you want to be coming into this uh, gate mark at the bottom, making that call early. So there comes a jibe just across in front, defining exactly where they want to be coming into this gate mark, making it pretty clear they want this near side mark. Uh, so again, creating that separation, but being bold with your manoeuvres, being bold old early on um, but we talk about these these penalties and you know we've kind of scrubbed over a little bit in the sense of that a penalty we can see where it's drawn those boats now JK Aurora they were one of the boats that uh, picked up a penalty were the one trying to do with uh, the uh, Jenica still up and again now they're out of touching distance of any other boat. So actually, you're already lumped with nearly a maximum sort of points and, and you're nearly out of the race. And they're the short races, quick two laps on around on this windward lured course. And um, with, uh, with looking at your overall leaderboard, you suddenly, by just going, do I be greedy? Do I try and squeeze in for that one extra boat? Or do I just play it safe, tack in behind them, don't break any rules, and one boat behind them, but I've got an opportunity to attack again, you know, that little bit of uh, the greed creeps in. The little devil sort of sat on the shoulder going, yep, go for it. And, and, and everyone's a competitive sailor. Everyone wants to jump in that and maximize every space. But sometimes it's knowing when to just go, look, this battle can remain and this battle can continue on this next leg. But if I do something silly now, then this puts me out of it. And um, this is where the pressure's really starting to creep in on this uh, penultimate day. Yeah, so hard coming back for those two boats at the back. Meanwhile, a, uh, a big split between the first two boats. Austria went out to the left. They went 
the, the side that served them well on the first beat. Uh, the Swedes deciding to go out to the right-hand side and see if they can attack the Austrian lead from the right-hand side of the course. Now, we, we saw all the benefit come from the left on the first race, but partly that's because the start drives you out in that direction. So maybe there's, there's good stuff to be explored on the right-hand side. Uh, but at the moment, I would have thought the Austrians, the light blue boat on the left, now we see them in full picture, I would have thought they feel quite comfortable where they are sort of middle left in the course right now. Yeah, it's a, a fairly solid place where you'd want to bank and be fairly conservative in the sense of if you wanted to attack that left, you can do. If you want to approach that right, they're going to be already slightly in defensive mode. And uh, and again, for the Swedes, that was a, a, a good, bold maneuver. They These guys made it nice and clear. They wanted that near side gate. And for the Swedes to attack the other gate creates that little bit of an opportunity to the uh, Austrians uh, come back and want to then sort of uh, pin a more defensive maneuver on them or do they allow them to split and create the breakaway? Um, I would definitely want to be mid left, uh, I think, with the breeze. Um, it's going to be a bit tighter, but you can see it looks a bit sort of flatter in that mid section. It looked like that breeze has just softened. Top left, we can identify there's still 10, 10 and a half knots. So it's still nice and clear, but it's uh, a tight battle between these lead two boats. Yes, now, it looks like from that uh, last shot we saw of the tracking that the Austrians will be able to get across the bow of the Swedes on starboard. And um, as, as we see those boats converge, it looks more and more comfortable for the Austrians. So now the question for the Swedes is, how much distance have they given away by going over to the right-hand side? Are they still holding second, or can the Poles, who we don't really expect to see in the top three, can the Poles even attack Sweden for second place, but a bit of a, a, a distance loss for Sweden on Austria, who uh, now are coming down and about to hoist the Jenica for the second time on these extremely short races. Um, and uh, this is the sail for the finish. So nice big gap, whilst the Swedes in the yellow vests, uh, the yellow vests are not about the yellow jersey here. That's the, just their choice of what they're, what they're wearing this week, are now really going to be pressured on this final run by the Poles who go around in boat number one. Yeah, now you can see how that considering if we uh, remember back to that first win with Mark and all, uh, all seven boats were all trying to, um, sorry, all eight boats trying to squeeze around that top mark together. And, and But now it's actually fairly orderly. It's all, they're tight. The racing's still really tight. There are only sort of a, a metre, half metre gaps in between. It's, you know, this is the biggest split away from these uh, boats here. But, um, and this is what, what makes the racing so fascinating. It's just one poor jibe, one poor judgment on, on that side. But uh, again, it's, it's been pretty predominant looking at this race course, looking at the wind stats that we've got. So we're getting all our data from uh, wind bots on the uh, marks and committee boats. Um, it's all being uh, sent up to the clown, bounced back down to the SAP sailing analytics. And it's what's uh, providing us just this fairly solid route of that mid left hand side being quite uh, a strong side to defend. And again, there's a, a pin end advantage on that start. So that's where you've got to be bold on that start, make your call early. But if you can get that tack in and, and, and favor those shifts, then you're in a a fairly soft route, but uh, looking at that, a little bit of breeze just starting to filter in again, 10 and a half knots, but we are starting to see that breeze slightly soften. So whether uh, that will change up and we'll see some shifts uh, come in, we'll wait and see. Christian Binder, he's just out of uh, picture behind his tactician, Werner Abenho, but at the back of the boat on the left is Christian Binder, former 470 sailor. I used to race him against the, in the 470 30-odd years ago. Uh, he's been a professional sailor for a good part of his life in the RC44, in the TP52. Um, but these days, he's focusing on his sailmaking business. And this, for him, is a bit of fun. Um, compared with the serious stuff that he's done in, in his career, th this is he does the Sailing Champions League to stay in touch with the sport because he still loves sailing. And, and this gives you an awful lot of bang for your buck. You get so many races in in a day. And the wonderful thing is you just fly down to Porto Cervo with your sailing kit, with your buoyancy aid, and the boat is all here ready to go for you. So it's, uh, it's a very low-maintenance way of, of getting some really high-quality sailing in. So after... Pulling out of the previous race, he got the, uh, the OCS for starting too soon across the line in the previous race. It's a race win for Jokla Breitenbrunn from Austria and quite a comfortable win for them. Ahead of the Swedes, still being chased across the line 
for second and third place by the Polish. Uh, but it looks like the Swedes have managed to hold off the Poles. But that's a very good result for Pogon Szczecin from Poland. A third place for them, I believe, is their best score so far. Um, and still to come across, there's some action here for fourth place. Who's going to get fourth place? It's Wessex Ex Exiles pushing Societe de Regat du Havre. Um, but actually, it's the Exiles that get across in first place. I think they've beaten Le Havre, who crossed the line, boat number four, and then very close behind them. The back three, they were a big distance behind those other two boats going around the Wimble Mark, so they've really made gains. And uh, so Odyssey Sailing Club from Poland, also a good result for them in sixth place. Um, Vasa Segelfereining from Sweden, they were in uh, sixth going around the Wimble Mark, and they ended up according to our tracking there, in last place. So there was a, um, a lot of place changing down that final run, which quite surprises me because most of that sailing down the final run was to be done on starboard jibe. It, it, the wind, I think, had skewed round a little bit. I didn't think there was going to be that much opportunity to attack, but we saw a lot of place changing just right at the, uh, the, the last minute of that race, Corky. Yeah, it was, as I say, sort of with that breeze uh, softening. And again, one of the biggest cruxes in all of this race is when do you go with that final jibe? You know that instantly the boat just positioned off your hip is going to sit on that inside line. Look for that jibe simultaneously. Try and create any kind of covering, any opportunity to accelerate forward. The difference of your high and low mode, when to just come up, when to gain that little bit of extra pressure, try and create any apparent breeze, or when to soak low. And there is that combination um, out on the water and being able to switch in between that. But uh, we did see a little bit of a, a battle uh, between Society de Regard, uh, Regard de Havre. Um, try and take on that inside line again with uh, the Wessex Exile Sailing Club. Um, they were trying to... Uh, have a bit of a battle and because of that they were so blinkered and controlling what they wanted to do and what was going on in the race they did two extra jibes in that center of the course which then allowed the other three boats to catch up well we uh, are going to see if we can get an interview with one of the sailors now um so hennick who have, who do you have to speak to us can anyone hear me on the water at the moment Hi, hi, who am I speaking to? Hi. Hello. Franz from Jakob Breitenbrunn, Austria. Hi, Franz. Thanks for joining us. Um, now, congratulations on that right. race win just now. What was your strategy Thanks. off the start line? Uh, going to the pin end and uh, have max speed. And, uh, and to the contrary from the race before we had in OCS, it works this time. Yes. Uh, so uh, were you a little bit surprised to discover that you needed to be pulled out of the race in the previous race? 50-50, uh, yeah. Um, and so where it's were you been, lying uh, in the race it's at been the time? on the line and... Uh, pardon me, I didn't understand your question. Uh, where were you in the, uh, what position in the race were you when the jury pulled you out of the previous race? On the, it was on the first windward mark where we expected to get an information if we have to get an information. And unfortunately, we get an information. Okay. But you held your nerve and uh, you, it didn't scare you off the start line for the next race. You got a really good start in the next race and uh, uh, you must be really pleased with how things are going. Yeah, we are. We get a uh, we get the uh, we get the line uh, very tight, and uh, get a good speed from the from on the first speed up, and uh, the right side with the wind, and it works perfectly. And Franz, what are you going to be doing now? You're going to be eating some pasta on board the good ship Matilda. If we go to Matilda and celebrate, and then we have one more race today, and hope it uh, we can double it. We wish you the best of luck. Um, you sailed fantastically just then, so uh, we, we, we hope you do equally well later on this afternoon. Thanks very much, Franz. Thanks, Andy. See ya. Bye-bye. So that was Franz Fellner sailing on board a Yacht Club Brighton, and that's the boat that he's going to be on board. That's the 
Good Ship Matilda. Uh, that's where the sailors hang out. And you can see some sailors getting ready to, to go out. Someone from KSSS from Sweden, uh, the Royal Yacht Club. They're going to be going out and representing their club shortly. And, and at the back, and I can also see, uh, I think it's Simone Ferraresi from Cercolo della Verabari, the leading skipper. Sorry, I think they're second place at the moment, actually, um, just behind R Regatta Club Bodensee. So uh, it's a nice place to spend some time. I spent most of um, my day yesterday on board Matilda, um, plying myself <laughs> with, uh, with free pasta, and a bit of Coca-Cola as well, Corky. I know you wouldn't go near the stuff, but... Well, black magic. No, it's... Um, well, no, it, it, I say it's a fantastic place for the sailors to be in. And this is how it, how it works. This is the, you know, we can see the ribs where the teams are poised, ready for the next flight. Um, and as soon as that boat crosses that line, the ribs alongside, the next team are on board, flags are swapped, and off we go. Um, and because of that, it's, it just rotates through these flights. And... You know, it's, it's, it's about what's bringing it together. You've got 24 clubs all out there, all wanting to race, eight uh, J70s racing each flight, and what a place to spend. You know, if you're able to sit out there with a whole group of friends, other clubs that you're racing against, have a little bit of banter with them, play a bit of a psychological game and start winding each other up, um, it, it's a great place to be. Also, what better way? Why would you want to be returning to the dock all the time when actually if you can be out in the water and learning from the other racing, applying it to your next strategy, win-win. And they're super friendly on board Matilda as well. Um, they, uh, they, they really look after the sailors extremely well. And uh, we saw a shot just then of um, a very nice looking yacht going out for sale. This, looking at this uh, shot of the harbour, this is taken from the roof of Yacht Club Costa Smeralda. Um, those docks are pretty empty, aren't they, Corky? Because we're just about to get into the busy three months of the season. But I'm, I'm just amazed that uh, such a beautiful place, apparently the most expensive real estate in anywhere in, in Europe, in the Mediterranean, um, and uh, these places are only used for one quarter of the year. It doesn't make sense to me. No, it's, it's, it's spectacular, isn't it? But... Um I, th I think sort of we're we're looking through very British eyes as well when we we come to places like this and but you know this drone just picks up on it. Look at the coastline; it's it's a, a beautiful island to explore. Um, but as you say, we're we're out of season and it's like it's sort of dial it on four or five days time and bang, it clicks. Everything opens and all the the marina's full again and it's like sort of suddenly the whole season starts. But um, yeah, I'm I'm. I'm I'm sure if uh, my wallet could take the, uh, the the thumping to be here, then I'd love to spend a bit longer here and, and check it out as well. But it's uh, it's. Well, I'm a glad you were buying the cappuccinos this morning, Corky. Well, you know that that that's me done for the week now. It's uh, <laughs> <laughs> so no, it's. it's I've it's, had to <laughs> save my money for some tooth a toothpaste and a toothbrush, and and if I can afford it and find a supermarket that's yet to open, I'll buy myself some underwear as well. Well, I'd I'd, I'd greatly. Appreciate that the the smell sits in the studio with you, but it's uh, but hey, I should your explain bag my my bag, my bag hasn't turned <laughs> up just in case <laughs> <laughs> it's not out of choice. Um, and uh, anyway, we are going. This is uh, flight twelve, and this is going to be race thirty five. <laughs> The next race is presented by One Ocean Foundation. So just less than a minute to the start of the next race. We saw how powerful the, uh, the left hand end, the yellow mark at the bottom of our screen just then is. Uh, that's with the Portuguese and uh, steering that boat is Vasco Serpa and Corky, you've done a little bit of commentary in the past with Vasco. I think he represented Portugal at the Olympics in Atlanta, 1996, in the laser, that legendary uh, battle, the first of many battles between Robert Scheidt and Ben Ainsley, the one that Robert Scheidt won. Uh, Vasco Serpa was seventh at those uh, Olympics, so a very experienced sailor. Um, and there we are on board with one of the Austrian teams, uh, Monze, just seven seconds to go, and the pin end is, is there for the taking. It's going to be taken by Olanska Segelsalskapet from Finland. 
So a good start for them. Oh, they're going to have to shoot the breeze a little bit to get around the edge to the fins. So again, we see a pin end start a little bit wasted, which again, very similar to the previous race. Now hands a bit of free space to Monzi in boat number five, who I think have got a fantastic start, Corky. Yeah, again, it's, it's, it's that positioning, trying to identify, wanting to be down that pin end. We all know that if you want to be that pin end boat, it's a greater risk. It presents greater reward if you can absolutely nail that uh, pin end, but that misjudgment and just not uh, getting exactly that uh, point, we saw that boat just having to st stick it up into the breeze, and that's caused them to lose a bit of pace. So uh, certainly for the Austrian team, Union Yacht Club, Monzi, uh, they were sat up. They've got a bit of breathing space now. But again, we can see this uh, left-hand side providing quite a dominant position. But his short courses, again, it's all about being close enough to your next rival, being able to go into that high mode. So this is exactly what the finish mode here is in boat number seven, closest to us. The fins are just trying to squeeze up. You can see them every so often just nudging that bow up a little bit higher, a little bit higher. And all of that is, is just trying to uh, unload what we call dirty air, disturbed air off the back of those sails onto the boat just after their hit. By doing that, it creates that opportunity to then be able to get the tack because at the moment, they are being held there. There comes that position. Not a great tack from the Austrian team union uh, yacht club Monzi there. Bit slow out of that. They certainly will have lost uh, a bit of pace. But now these guys are right out on that left-hand side approaching in on that left lay line. Um, they, they got to that left-hand ley line extremely quickly, didn't they? I just wonder if the breeze has shifted around. But we, we see the right-hand side of this race course a lot more popular and a lot more populated than it was the previous time, which was very much the, the fleet going to the left-hand side. But it looks like they haven't quite got up to the, to the ley line. So maybe Olandska Segel Salska Pet from Finland, the most left-hand boat, is still doing okay. But it looks like a much more even race across the race course this time. Well, just looking at uh, some of the analytics come through, because of that uh, pin end bias, and it's a reasonable amount, it's saying sort of 25, 28 meters sort of difference at that uh, uh, pin end bias. Then with that, if you're coming off and you're not right up on uh, on someone's hip, then you can easily get bumped out towards that right. So I just think that a lot of the boats, because they're lining up, they're all being quite tight towards that pin end and uh, the lanes aren't great. We're seeing a lot of boats have to take that tack out early, causing them to uh, sit in that mid to mid right side of things. And again, these uh, two boats coming back across towards the right are going to now struggle to find lanes on this left hand side while sailing a long way out towards this side. Boat number two sailing towards our camera position. That's the boat from Cascais, Vasco Serpa, really picking up um, whatever's left over in terms of free lanes. You can see them in the back of picture, boat number two, but the Portuguese really being dictated to, as opposed to Monzi, who are still in a good controlling position. We're on board now with the Portuguese. Vasco Serpa at the back, looking a little bit grim-faced, maybe as he should, because... He hasn't got a lot to work with right now. His tactician, um, obviously, it looks like his tactician took a bump to the head recently. He's got that bandage on his forehead. That's not looking good. Um, that, it, it, that boom, you do need to watch out for. But, uh, oh, so the boats on this side are overstanding the ley line, and they, they may struggle to find a clean lane into the Wimber Mark. It's going to be a German team from Wannsee that go around in first place followed by the Lithuanians, Nauticus. So out goes the pole, up goes the Jenica. Really good set by Vanze, already with a kite set, followed round by uh, the Lithuanians. And then extremely tight, as we see the ports and the starboard tackers come round together. Will boat number six have got round cleanly, only just getting round without avoiding the windward mark, without hitting the windward mark. Um, and at the back is boat number two, that's the Portuguese, and uh, they've not had a good round, in, except that they've managed to get down the inside of the two boats, so that's good tactical positioning by the Portuguese at the back. So there's going to be a lot of place changing as uh, the Finns look over their shoulder, the ASS flag on the back of the Finns. It looks like the Finns, who I thought maybe had a chance of leading round the women mark, are now being swallowed up by the pack. 
Well, again, it all was that sort of positioning coming in towards that uh, windward mark. Just see a flag. There's a penalty being applied. Uh, just trying to pick up. It is to the Swiss. We saw a, a flag go up. Um, let's see if we can uh, get a little bit more info and, and uh, see if we can go out to Hinnock and uh, see if we can hear what uh, what happened again. Another busy windward mark. But uh, Hinnock, if you can hear us, uh, can you explain what happened with that penalty? Uh, yes, uh, I hope you can hear me. We can hear um, you, Hinnock. Yeah, the Swiss guy. Oh, perfect. <laughs> yeah, it was really tight. Uh, everybody was fighting for the left lane. There was no space. And um, yeah, the Finns lost a lot because of those tight battles. And uh, yeah, Union Club Mondsee gained into third place coming from the left side. But the green boat, the Swiss boat, didn't quite uh, respect the rights of the other boats and yeah, did the penalty turn now. But it's in last place, far behind the pack. And we are approaching now the gate with still the uh, Fein Seklos and Wannsee leading. Thanks very much, Henrik. So the boat that we've been talking about, the Swiss boat, now at the back after taking that penalty. Bear in mind that Kreuzlingen won the first three heats of the, uh, of the competition um, uh, back on Thursday. And they, they've done pretty well recently. They've re their last two places were first and second. So now for the Swiss to be lying in eighth place, it now puts them back only just above the drop zone. They're in sixth place. And remember, only the top seven go through to the finals in Samaritz later on this year. So the, the Swiss really bouncing all over the scoreboard from first to last. And uh, a lot of work for the Swiss to do. Already up onto the second beat and the Germans... Vanze selling out, out of picture to the left-hand side. Uh, Monze also doing well from Austria. And then Nauticus from Lithuania. This is a very good uh, race for the Lithuanians, who we wouldn't necessarily expect to see up in the top few. But the, uh, the green boat chasing the rest of the fleet are the Swiss, who we expect to see better of. We're on board with Kaskais right now, uh, Vasco Serpa, steering the boat out of the leeward mark. And that uh, position when he came round that windward mark, sitting on the hip of inside everyone else, uh, gave him this position here where he was able just to jibe inside uh, the Swedish pair, just tacking out now. So he's gained that extra little bit of place already just because of his positioning at the windward mark. So this is, you know, what's magic about sailing is that you're thinking so far in front. It's like a game of chess. It's not right. So exactly that, his position at the windward mark gave him the opportunity to take that extra boat at that gate mark. So it all links in. It's not a matter of, right, I'm now thinking about this next leg. I'm now thinking about this. You're already trying to think far enough in front. How am I positioning? If I'm over towards the right-hand side, if I come in on the right-hand ley line, who am I going to be contending with? Will I get tacked on? Will I get dirty air? Will there be space? But what we've seen time and time again, and we're only a, a, a few races in, um, is that first windward mark, everyone is willing to basically pretty much play Russian roulette with that windward mark. And, it, and it's, um, I'm just quite surprised at it, rather than, you know, we see it a lot in catamaran racing where they're happy just to kind of punch over that lay line to allow that inside line for boats to squeeze in to make sure they don't pick up any penalties with the boat slowing down into a tank. In a way, unless you've got a really clear route through on that uh, port hand lay line or port route into that windward mark, I would wanting to be leaving a bucket low more space so that if you did tack and someone was coming in on starboard, there was that inside line for them. You admit, fine, they might gain that inside line and that's that battle still going on. But as soon as you pick up a penalty there... As you say, it suddenly lumps you with such a harsh penalty because of how tight the racing is. Going from what could be a second or a third down to eighth is, you know, again, it's a, a hard-hitting penalty. When in uh, certain other fleet races, if we look at Olympic sort of racing and uh, picking up and just doing a, a, a two-turn penalty or a, a, a one-turn penalty, then actually you're still very much in the mix. Here, it, it could be uh, first to last in a matter of moments. Yeah, absolutely. It looks this time, though, that the boats on Port Tack coming in from the left-hand side are going to have sufficient lead to be able to get across. Certainly, we can say that for Vanze in the lead. Um, it may be a little bit harder for Monse, who we we're just on board with just then, to say whether they're going to be able to get across. So now that we're seeing that cross beginning to happen at the Wimber Mark as the leaders go round, 
on board Vonze. Uh, but behind them, the battle for second and third, potentially a lot closer. Will Monze be able to get around cleanly in front of Nauticus? I wouldn't tack in there, boys. Oh, I'm not sure about that. I'm not sure that Monze did enough to keep clear. And I think that uh, the jury might have something to say about this to Monze. Will boat number five be told to do a spin? Will Lithuania be able to move ahead into second place? You can see the jury up behind them. No flag we're being flown. For, we're waiting for this. They're right behind them. Surely there's got to be some. No, they've peeled off. That well, maybe oh, the here's Lithuanians... another umpire turned up behind them. So whether they're waiting. So there's an umpire rib just straight behind these uh, boats, right alongside them. I'm. I'm stunned if no penalty was handed out then and again that basically came back to exactly my point if they had actually carried on on port that would have given them space to squeeze inside and uh, no penalty infringe but because they went for that tack right in front yeah I'm, I'm with you on that Andy meanwhile look at this I mean are these boats going to finish fifth or they're going to finish last I mean there's just nothing to choose between the back of the pack so we got two interesting battles going on. We got the battle for second and third, and we got the battle for fifth to eighth place. And remember, whether you come second or third, or whether you come fifth or sixth or seventh or eighth, it's all points. It doesn't really matter. There's a bit more ego riding on the line when it's a battle for second or third. But really, the battles at the back of the fleet matter just as much because, as you said earlier, Corky, there are no discarded races. You count every single race that you do in your scoreline. You can't drop your worst race. So every point counts. Doesn't matter where you are in this fleet. As we see Vanze staying well ahead of all the trouble, able to enjoy a beautiful roll jibe, probably their last jibe before they go across the finish. And as we so often see, a very comfortable win for the leader of these races. Um, but all hell is breaking loose behind them. And uh, that's a, a beautiful shot of just how many battles are still yet to be played out. The battle between Lithuania... Um, and Monzi in second and third place. Well, the battle there for second and third is really interesting uh, with uh, Satan Club Nauticus uh, trying to stay on that inside line and have Judd in front of Union Club Monzi, and that could be the deciding factor as uh, the Germans take the win. Very subdued handshake, very pleased with themselves there, ready for the uh, next it, flight. You can, t you can tell that it means something to them, though, because the Italians, Chocolo della Velibari, when they win a race, there's, there's barely any acknowledgement of it. I mean, they're just so used to winning. It's just, oh, yeah, just shrug your shoulders and just won another race. But, um, I mean, Vonze, they're actually doing extremely well. They're, they're, oh, we're coming into that final now, so who's going to get second place across the line it looks like it's nauticus so nauticus have managed to turn over monze and so they deserve to do because i think monze were a little bit lucky to uh, to get away with that uh, but it was nauticus that crossed the finish line in second place ahead of monze despite what the tracker says well it was that inside line they took they took that jibe early and they soaked low but this is going to be down to the wire here, late jibe. This is going to come down to their boat handling. Can they hold it? They're soaking very low. So will that grey Jenica now flogging as it goes past the yellow boy do just enough to get third place? Yes, it will be. Orlansa Selgelsal Skapet, followed by boat number six. It's uh, the boat club from Sweden. And then the green boat, Kreuzling. And so green got back up to uh, sixth place after being dead last. And uh, Cass Geis, uh, who um, we thought were maybe going to be able to pull through, ended up with seventh. And then the Norwegians, Lovik, Selforening, ending up in eighth place. So all kinds of place changing. And how, how the uh, Norwegians dropped so far back, I don't know if they had to take a penalty on the, on the final run. But the Norwegians that we see there dropped back an awful long way. And... Uh, Still seeing that Monze is, is recorded as second boat in that race. I'm not sure about that. I really think that Nauticus uh, were the second boat in that, in that race. Yeah, no, I agree. And um, also just going back to your uh, last point, sort of about the, the Norwegians, uh, Larvik, Selvanein, uh, they basically uh, did pick up a penalty up by that windward mark and uh, just looking at the tracker, were spinning. So again, 
what that penalty was defined by, whether a rule breakage at that windward mark or something the umpires saw there, but uh, certainly they weren't happy with, and that's uh, what saw them uh, sink to the back. But uh, yeah, completely agree with that. Now, the place changes. Uh, let's uh, have a look at that leaderboard and just see whether it's picked up on, uh, say, the leaderboard has picked up on it. That um, So on that final leaderboard that it does put Mondancy into third. So it did go. Okay. So Monzi in third, Nauticus from Lithuania in second. And winner of that race was Vonzi, who are now in third place overall. And they've only once scored outside the top three of any of their races in their second race on the first race of the day, sorry, day of the competition back on Thursday. They got a fifth place. Apart from that, all their scores in the top three of these races, and, and that's surely got to be a, a race-winning move, you would think, um, except that uh, Cercolo della Velabari, all their scores inside the top two, except for one third place and one OC fit the whole flag into uh, <laughs> the name of these uh, clubs onto the flag. Anyway, we're going to do some analytics of the previous race, I understand. Yeah, well, generated by the SAP Sailing Analytics. Let's have a look, and we try and... Uh simplify sailing as much as we possibly can and and the three key areas um that obviously will impact on your racing is the distance maneuvers and speed and here's a great input of uh, what you're looking for so of course if you sail a shorter distance then you're hopefully gonna make your race course a lot shorter you do it the one in the quickest speed then you're certainly going to be towards the front and again maneuvers we look at maneuvers because again we had to take it with a pinch of salt, depending on how shifty the conditions are, where you were on the start line and, and trying to get out of bad air. But if we look at the top boat there, okay, top speed or one of the unequal top speeds. Uh, so they've done that. Maneuvers are short and, of course, distance. So, again, if your speed is good, you're minimizing distance and you're minimizing maneuvers, the likelihood you're going to be somewhere close towards that front. Easier said than done. So once you're up at the front, you can do uh, more, uh, less, sorry, less maneuvers, and you're more likely to hit a slightly stronger speed because you've got no one around you impacting that as much. But certainly those are what the three things a lot of sailors are trying to look for. And of course, you can look down and go, well, look, in the finish, they did a, a really nice short distance, but we've added maneuvers and suddenly nearly half a boat, uh, half a knot slower on boat speed, then it's uh, going to impact. So again, it's a balance between those three things and that hopefully should tie into uh, trying to simplify sailing. You're trying to minimize distance, minimize maneuvers, maximize speed. And that shorter distance of uh, Farin Segler House and um, Vanze suggests to me that maybe the left-hand side of the track was a, was a, a shorter route up the, uh, the course. Maybe the wind shift on that side helped them sail a shorter distance. Um, Yacht Club Costa Smeralda, that's where we're uh, doing our commentary from. That's a shot that you see from the roof of Yacht Club Costa Smeralda. Beautiful Yacht Club. Also, one of the most famous and one of the most influential. So many important regattas take place here each season.
winning obviously is the icing on the cake, but just taking part in it is fantastic. Everyone has a great time. All of us want to come back next year. Yeah, Costa Smeralda, it has become a mecca for sailing over the last 50 years. It's just over, I think it's 52 years old, this club, established by the Aga Khan back in 1967. And uh, yeah, one of the sailors just then said, we'll be back next year. Of course you will. I mean, why wouldn't you? Especially sailing those kind of maxi yachts, which... Probably the Yacht Club Costa Smeralda is most famous for hosting the uh, the Maxi World Championships, which happen here each year, the Rolex Swan Cup, the Laura Piana Regatta. And uh, these boats are probably about the smallest boats that are ever hosted at the Yacht Club Costa Smeralda. It, it's very much a, a big boat venue, but it's great for these sailors, some of whom, it should be said, are also Maxi sailors in other parts of their, their jobs. But they, they love sailing on the J70s because it's, it's reconnecting with the real grassroots of the sport, it, it's, it's not about throwing money at the problem. It's, it's about how good are you on the start line, how good are you at communication, manoeuvres, boat handling, all the basics that still go into maxi yacht racing, but with uh, not quite as glamorous, it has to be said, but, but also maybe uh, back to the, uh, the real nuts and bolts of what makes sailing so, such a great competitive sport. Well, exactly that. It's, it's uh, a fairly in the world of sailing, uh, a cheap way. And as we said, uh, a way of maximizing huge amounts of racing. You're on the race course. Again, you don't have a team, a support team all around you. These boats are all maintained, looked after. You jump from boat to boat. You don't sail the same number all the time. You're rotating around in the flight. So they've all got to be the same. And we can see on short uh, here, this is uh, one of the support teams here, the rig boat alongside, just trying to make a few amendments to uh, one of these boats and, and get it set. But this is it. The racing's the same. It's one design. It's not handicap. You haven't had a team where you've practiced and practiced and practiced on the same waters. You're all coming out. You've done your qualifications, your league racing. But again, the leagues don't necessarily stick with the J70s. They may have moved around in different classes depending on what's in different countries. And so with, uh, with that, these teams might be sailing completely different boats. And some of these teams, it might be the first time they're stepping into sort of a J70 to compete. So suddenly that's just uh, mixing it up. But you then look at the maxis and the, the team are, uh, are very different. You've got a whole team, a support team, and potentially you've done multiple regattas back to back. But um, as you say, very pure, exactly what's great about racing, one design racing, tight racing on a short course in uh, beautiful conditions. Then, um, yeah. Well, the, the Dutch that we're on board with here, apparently there's a problem on that boat that needs resolving. So we've got a bit of time to the next start while the rigging crew, the, the repair team, affect whatever kind of repairs onto the Dutch boat uh, that need to take place. Um, so we're going to find out a little bit more about the One Ocean Foundation that we were talking about earlier. The mission of the One Ocean Foundation is to accelerate solutions concerning marine pollution, inspiring international leaders, promoting the blue economy and spreading a culture of sustainability and preservation of the marine environment. The initiative is strongly supported by Princess Zara Aga Khan. We think it's our responsibility as Yacht Club, as passionate people on the, on the, that live basically with their passion from the water. Um, to really protect it for the next generations and we're trying to create a community to, to really uh, create awareness and so the Carta Esmeralda is a basic commitment that everyone of us can do I mean we can, we can, we can change our habits from tomorrow if you want to, even today We need to clean water to do our sports but also for other reasons it's, it's hugely important uh, to take care of the environment uh, in which we sport, but also in which we live. And for that reason, it's hugely important that we start doing a better job in, in keeping all the oceans clean. Well, we all depend on the, on the planet. I think it's essential that uh, some uh, companies and uh, sailors and all people around the world pay attention to the plastic pollution of the ocean. This event is a fantastic place to reach a lot of people. 
I think it's uh, great that we also got this bottle from One Ocean here, so we can fill it with water. You can change from one day to the other, but I think if you start the process, that's an important thing. The more clubs can join in our mission, the better it is. Great to see the sailors getting behind the One Ocean Foundation. And uh, one of the sailors there interview was uh, Marie Pooley. She's on board this boat now, which looks like it's up and running. This is the boat that we were waiting to, uh, to get repaired. Looks like the Dutch will be ready to go racing very shortly. That's the race committee boat. And the breeze is holding up really nicely. Um, Corky, we got four flights that they're getting through today and each flight takes roughly an hour to get through. That only leaves us with two flights tomorrow for the final day. Why is such a short day on the final day? Well, uh, there was a slight concern about what this breeze is going to do. As I say, we, we chatted about it a, a little earlier, about this uh, fog and mist rolling in and a bit of confusion for the locals. We, we don't see this. We don't, don't get this. Well, there is due to be rain later on coming in uh, this evening and, and through till tomorrow. Um, and because of that, there is a slight concern of what that's going to do to the breeze, whether it squashes and, and dampens down that breeze or whether it's actually going to increase it. But again, we've got the joys of sailing, but we're at either end of the spectrum. If there's no wind, we're not sailing. If there's too much wind, we're not sailing. And so there's that balance point of uh, a window of opportunity. And so what they've done is they've managed to uh, get an extra flight in uh, yesterday. And, um, and by doing that... We've got uh, four flights today, and once we've got through those four flights, it will leave two tomorrow. So fingers crossed, no matter what the weather throws at us, we'll be able to get through those two. Yeah. Uh, rain, you just don't hear about rain in Portocello. Coming back to what we were saying earlier about the strange weather in Europe, um, I, I don't think this place knows what to do with rain. It's, it's never heard of rain. It hasn't got an, even got a word for it. It's not, not really set up for it or anything, so we could... Uh, could find anything being thrown at us here. and um, But uh, I'm sure the hospitality, everything will continue on. The uh, sailors, well, we're used to a bit of rain. Most of us are all from the wonderful European places where a lot of the time it, it rains most of the time. So uh, from that, we're all uh, hardened to it. But again, you know, rain, we're not worried about that. You're going to get wet while racing. But interesting, a uh, bit of a procession going on, driving around that pin end, just identify exactly where they want to be on this line. Uh, just over two minutes to this start. So at this point, again, your boat, you've done the setup, you've jumped in, you've uh, got yourself settled back in. This breeze uh, back up a little bit by about a knot or so, up to about 12 knots. But you can look at the race course in this drone shot. It's a great, great way to be able to see. There's not a lot of uh, land mass or any uh, topography in that sort of sense to, to impact what the breeze is doing. It's pretty low level stuff and filter through, uh, which is why we're not seeing the wind move around too much. Uh, it's generally fairly steady. The uh, consistency as well of um, the velocity has been pretty good. So uh, at the moment, it is all planning to get towards that start line. And so uh, we are flight number 12, and this is going to be race 36. <laughs> The next race is presented by SAP. I'm particularly looking forward to this race because we've got the top two in the series overall, the, the two hottest teams so far in this regatta competing against each other. Watch out for boat number one. That's Regatta Club Bodensee. So boat number one is also first overall. Um, and then we've got uh, Cercolo della Velabari, the reigning champions from last year, in second overall at the moment. They're in boat number four. We've got 24 seconds to go. We've got other hot teams in here as well. Um, Ara and ZV Massenroa from the Netherlands, they've won quite a few races. But uh, really the, the competition, the race that I want to see is between boat number one and boat number four, between the Swiss and the Italians. So this is almost like a, a double pointer in that respect. The pin end, very clear at this end. Boat six got it all to themselves. Will that be a clear start? It looks like it is a clear start 
off the line. Boat number one up at the far end. Boat number four, second row start for them, already having to tack out for clear air out to the right-hand side. So uh, boat number four, Cercolo della Velabari. Not a great start by the Italians unless they really want that right-hand side. No, we saw them uh, fairly early on at about 30, 40 seconds to go, get bumped into that second row. And um, again, just seemed a bit strange that they didn't take that little tack out, come back again and double tack back into a space or, or force a position. They clearly obviously didn't want to get down towards the pin end because they could have borne away and looked for that. It was a little bit late on. Um, but they seem happy with that um, tactic of going out towards that right. Uh, looking at the wind stats, uh, certainly the shortest distance and that slight port end uh, bias again is still keeping uh, the favouritism towards that mid left hand side. Uh, Breeze fairly consistent uh, across that course, maybe a smidge more on that sort of uh, mid left hand side again. So um, a bold move from uh, Chocolo della Velabari to head out towards that right on such a, an early occasion. But I think uh, it all started to go wrong at 30, 40 seconds to go. Yes, and I'm really not given much choice. Um, but it is extremely congested at this end of the line, at this, this end of the course. Um, we're seeing five boats really close together. And, and boat number six has got to wait for four other boats to decide to tack on to port before boat six, uh, which is... RR and ZV Masson Roa from the Netherlands before they can do their thing. Boat number seven up on their hip, uh, Societe de Regat Rochelais. But no, they're going to duck behind all of them. So yeah, they're giving away space, knowingly doing so. They feel like they've run out of ley line and they better get out of there to be able to give themselves half a chance of some breathing space. But so much space being given away by boat number six who are, they were nominally in the lead according to the tracking, but without, without any control. Now the Dutch have put themselves way back in the pack, but at least they can dictate some of their own terms. Was it a price worth paying? We'll have to wait and see. Meanwhile, out on the right-hand side, you can see the green trace of Cercolo della Velabari, the reigning uh, sailing champions league champions from last year on starboard tack, the only boat on starboard tack at the moment. And it looks like they are going to be crossed by uh, Poulsen from uh, the Czech Republic. So uh, not one of the top performers, but currently just ahead of the Italians. Well, just to, to kind of reinforce, sort of using the SAP sailing analytics, we've uh, I've just identified looking at through that manoeuvre loss of uh, what the Dutch team KNZ and uh, RV Muden um, took on that uh, attack. According to uh, the data and what we saw is that, yes, it uh, brought them back into the middle of the pack, but that lost them nearly 23 metres of distance on, uh, on Bosby from taking that tack, then having to duck those three other boats because it was an aggressive duck as well. It's, uh, you know... I'm not sure whether I would have taken that. I would have probably sitting just up onto that port ley line a little bit further and uh, and looked for a gap and um, accepted you would have had to follow a transom in. But um, nearly 23 metre loss, that's uh, a Three pretty Three boat lengths, isn't it? Yeah. Three boat lengths of a, a J70, the kind of boat that we're looking at. So now we're into that point of convergence. It looks like one of the boats on starboard tack is clear ahead of all the boats coming in on port tack. As long as they are on their final approach, it looks like they're a little bit below ley line. Will they have to put in another tack? It looks like they're going to have to do a quick double tack at the top. Uh, so that's boat number five. It's the, the, the boat from Czech Republic. Are they going to be able to tack round or has boat number three managed? They certainly had to go round a big distance round the outside. And you can see how close things are. There's surely got to be some collisions going on yeah, at the Cercolo back of the pack. Yeah, Bari then uh, did exactly the same. Position just low on that. Uh, but they took the tack onto port to avoid uh, or to try and make a, a gap. And uh, they head into that gap. But by doing that, I reckon they're going to pick up a penalty. Keep an eye on the umpire. Red flag's gone up. It is pointing towards... It's got to go to the Italians, surely. That, uh, I would have thought that was a bold move by them. They uh, took that tack onto a port. They were okay with that position, but it was when they rolled back into that starboard tack. But uh, are we, the flag are went. Are we seeing the yellow boat doing something with its Jenica? Is, is, boat, is it boat number three? Three. Is going to have to take KSSS. a turn? 
it looks like they're waiting for the other boat to pass before they start doing a penalty turn. So it's the Royal Swedish Yacht Club. Bjorn Hansen, the, one of the world's best match racers, comes off worse in a close quarter situation. And it's going to put the, uh, the Swedish right to the back of the pack. And meanwhile, it looks like another penalty for the dark blue boat. And that could be Regatta Club Bodensi, our overall leaders. Um, so two penalties by some significant teams. This is all playing into the hands of the leaders and also Cecolo della Vellabari. Let's see what Hinnock, if he can hear us out in the water, what's his uh, impression of how things are going out on out there? Hi, Hinnock. Yeah, we saw Cecolo uh, della Vellabari was really... Hi, hi, Andy. Was really uh, upset at the jury. They, were, um, they won poor tech and... Um, Yes, take back to starboard and uh, both boats, yeah, the Swedish boat and Regatta Club Bodensee uh, didn't quite manage to fit in. And uh, the umpires took some time but decided on both penalties. And now uh, Circular Vabari looks comfortable, maybe in first position, at least in second and approaching the gate. Hinek, thank you very much for that summary and uh, what a dramatic mark rounding we saw just now and how the places have changed because of that and it's really played into the hands of the team from the Czech Republic uh, who are having the the race of their lives at the moment really sailing fantastically they're in 10th uh, overall they actually won their previous heat as well so these guys are, are really learning and they're putting themselves in contention for one of those top seven places they're in 10th overall at the moment and uh, only six or seven points off that coveted top seven places and in seventh place overall is KSSS who is now in last in this race having been one of the boats to be given the penalty the Royal Swedish Yacht Club helmed by the match racer Bjorn Hansen who knows all about penalties he, he knows how to dish them out uh, but he's not so used to being given them in a fleet race and a really slick drop there by boat number seven front of picture that's the french they got some top 49er sailors on board we're now on board with the race leaders uh, from the czech republic uh, the team from truck pulsen and sailing a fantastic race route now looking very calm and in control well uh, oh yes no I, I, so yes i was just drawn attention that, that some of these shirts on board the boats just aren't long enough are they corky <laughs> no there's uh, there's Clearly, uh, a lot to see out on the wa <laughs> on the waters, uh, but uh, again, uh, good, quite good happily not he worried knew he was about on camera, wasn't he? And he turned round for all of our benefit, which not, is not not worried nice about uh, fashion out there at the moment. It's all about the racing, and that's uh, exactly what these guys have. They are straight back on. Look at the lead they've got. They've got over a bit of uh, space out again, sticking out towards that left hand side. Looking at the breeze, it's. Uh, looking again in that left-hand phase. So strange that people are, are still bouncing out towards that right. But again, it isn't necessarily about just going out and winning races. It's that consistency. It's about putting yourself in that second and third spot and just keeping ticking away, not picking up that. And as we've picked up is, um, you know, Bjorn Hansen sort of uh, with those penalties at the top knows how uh, detrimental that can be to uh, your overall lead. But um for the uh, truck pools and they're uh, doing a really nice job out in front and as Andy said just uh, winning their last of the race as well is uh, just really bringing them back up into contention and um, this is th the last race of flight 12 so this will give us a, a complete overall uh, leaderboard with all of the boats race so um, this will give uh, a real idea and sense of overall positions uh, before we would move into flight 13 so by doing this, this uh, will identify the points and where the opportunities are for attack. Well, the team from the Czech Republic, they're not used to sailing the J-70. We are seeing them improve. And these two first places, that we're both in the last race, oh, we're just coming up to a, a cross here. So, oh, so just as they go to duck, boat number four, Chocolo de la Verabari, decides to go into attack. So that was a needless giveaway of space there by boat number two. Um, but uh, the Italians in the uh, the green number four sailing a really good race considering that they were bounced out of the start at the beginning of this race. Not a great start for the Italians, but they held their nerve and somehow, despite...
Corky's prediction, they managed to uh, avoid one of those penalties of that really congested first Wimmer mark. And the important thing is that those Port Tackers, including the Italians, seem to be crossing the boats on starboard this time. Uh, on board with the Dutch, and uh, at the top mark, it's boat number five. And, oh, taking that, that boom only just going over the top of the Wimble mark. That, that was cutting it pretty fine. But uh, the Czech Republic now with a very healthy lead, followed by the Italians, the reigning champions from the 2018 Sailing Champions League, going round um, in second place just ahead of the Dutch. <laughs> On board with the Dutch going round in third place. And you can see a bit of luffing going on behind. Oh, it's getting very dramatic here again for the second time round. Is that? Yes, there's going to be a hit on the Wimber Mark by boat number six. They're going to have to take a turn. Now boat number eight is completely stopped. And now who's going round? Buffalo Girls round the outside. It is boat number three. And it's Kungliga Svenska Segel Salskapet. Have they got a chance to move up from last place into third place. This is a great comeback by Bjorn Hansen as boat number six is forced to go into a spin. They were, I think they were third in this. Oh no, yeah, I think they were third in that before they, um, before they hit the mark. So that's an absolute disaster for the Dutch. Such a turnaround. So the Dutch go from third to last and the Swedish go from pretty much last into third place, or oh, fourth place I think it is. So um, huge place changes, and we're seeing this pattern quite often at that Wimbledon Mark Corky. The first couple get round cleanly, and then it, it all turns to custard after that. Well, it's exactly that. It's just these uh, turning marks that there's the speed differences. We're noting, of course, there's half a knot boat speed in between the boats, how you're sailing the boat, but not enough to really significantly change places. The one place that's always going to happen is at turning marks, whether that be at the gate, but at the moment it's all been fairly fairly controlled with the two gate marks. We are seeing that defined split between the boats, but at the windward mark, when they all congest, it's a, it's a really sort of a, just kind of thrown everything in. It's a, a big gamble for some of these boats. And, um, I, you know, I appreciate sort of, uh, you've got to try and commit in and you've got to be bold with your manoeuvre. But again, a lot of them misjudging that starboard lay line, sitting a little bit low, trying to shoot that mark. Then the breeze are slowing down and getting caught up on that mark. But, um, you know, for the guys out in front, once you get round and a bit clearer again, then uh, they're uh, golden, really. Exactly what these guys have done here. These guys being Truck Pulsen from the Czech Republic and looking extremely comfortable and making their race win in the previous race that these guys did look less and less like a fluke and more like a growing trend. Uh, so this is a team that seems to be getting to grips with the J70 very quickly. Redek Smetana, Jan Skoda, Thomas Marek and Michaela Mertlova sitting on the bow, just about to cross the line. And I bet we're going to see some smiles from this team. And yeah, high fives. Well deserved. Chocolo della Velabari last off the start line. Can they hold on to second across the finish line? It looks like they're going to bring it back. And uh, the Italians crossing the line, followed by boat number two, which is the Dutch from Weden. So really good, solid race by the Italians, looking so chilled. Simone Ferraresi. Then we got a big fight for fourth place. At the moment, it looks like it's KSSS from Sweden. Bjorn Hansen salvaging a good result for fourth place across the line. But who is going to take fifth place? So close between seven and eight. The photo finished between boat seven and boat eight. And there's not much to choose between the final two, but it's the dark blue boat that will get across the line just ahead of Purple Masson Ruhr, who took that penalty at the final Wimbledon mark. So the Dutch relegated to the back of the fleet. Um, so we're going to see if we can get an interview with uh, Simone Ferraresi or one of the guys off Cecolo della Velabari, bearing in mind. Uh, that in that race, they were up against the series leaders. Now, the series leaders um, who have had such a consistent performance, um, they, they got a fifth in their first race back on Thursday. All their other scores 
of um, uh, have been up in the, the top three other than a fourth place yesterday, or sorry, earlier today. But that race, they got a seventh place. Now let's see if we can have a word with Simone Ferraresi in a moment. And we can see Hinnock just coming into screen. And that's Simone reaching out to pull the two boats together. And on board are uh, getting the yellow jerseys of the Saro Boat Club from Sweden. But yes, uh, while we're waiting to speak to Simone Ferraresi, he won't know and he probably won't be too bothered at this stage, Corky, but they have actually moved up into first place after, uh, overall after getting that second place in that race because Bodensi have now dropped from first to third after getting a seventh place. Yeah, as I say, always nice, a nice confidence booster and a, a nice place to be, um, you know, to go into uh, if you can win the qualified and, of course, setting yourself up really nicely. They are, again, uh, the overall leaders from last year as well. And so uh, looking forward to, uh, to carrying on that uh, progression. OK, well, let's see what Simone Ferraresi has to say for himself. After such a poor start, Simone, I was disappointed with your start in that race. Yeah, uh, we were also a bit. Uh, we thought uh, the last call was that uh, at the end maybe we like it a little bit uh, to be clean and uh, on uh, more on the right, but uh, we got too close on leeward on the, the other boats. But uh, we got a good channel of wind and uh, Valerio, Leo and Corrado made a really good job to bring me back on the, the race and uh, then we managed also to give uh, luckily a bit of penalties to our uh, to the other boat, so and we kept clean and uh, yeah, it was good. Yeah, well, it, getting around that Wimble Mark was extremely busy, and we couldn't tell where the penalties were going to go. And I, I saw that you hoisted your Jenica straight away, but was there any part of you that wondered if you might get the penalty? I think no, because we were on starboard, a bit lower on the line, and um, we saw the chance to block Bjorn uh, coming from the left, and uh, we managed to give him a penalty. And uh, then uh, I think the Swiss were uh, on leeward of us and maybe broke the rule 17 uh, or touched the mark, I don't know. But uh, all of a sudden we got clean, a good speed, and uh, we kept the race uh, well. And uh, yeah, the second, the second uh, was uh, really good, I think, uh, for this race. So, Mane, you're a top match racer, so is Bjorn Hansen. So, for a moment there, um, did it feel like you were in a match race with the Swedish? Uh, I hope he's not going to come back with the revenge. <laughs> <laughs> well, Bjorn Hansen, he, he's always smiling. I, I'm sure he'll uh, forgive you if he feels that you, uh, you were too tough on him. The other thing was, uh, were you aware of the other boats in, in the race uh, and who they were? For, and, and I think particularly of... A regatta club Bodense, who have been leading this series. Um, you were you were the second place boat, and you were up against the overall leader in the series. But they didn't have a good race; they were seventh. So that changes the leaderboard in your favour now. Yes, they they were the boat uh, close to us. Uh, the other boat had got uh, a penalty, and um, yeah, they lost uh, a little bit the control of the race there. Okay. I think uh, they were just behind us. And uh, yeah, we were aware that uh, Bjorn and uh, the Swiss were uh, in the same race. And um, but we, we we wanted just to be clean, and uh, we are confident about our speed and uh, being out of troubles is uh, still our goal. So then, of course, in the top mark, uh, you cannot do anything when uh, all the boats are coming together. You you have to practice to do a bit of uh, match racing. <laughs> this time was good. Uh, hope uh, the next uh, is going to be the same. Simone, we saw a great lesson in how to extract yourself from a, a bad start and still get a great finish across the finish line. And that, that now puts you in the lead overall. So congratulations and keep up the good work. Yeah, it's still long, so, so there is a lot of races and uh, we, we just try to, to be focused on uh, our uh, good points and uh, have our troubles. So. Thanks to my team uh, that is uh, doing a really good job uh, at the moment and uh, helping me being in the races. Thanks, Simone, and en enjoy the pasta on board the good ship, Matilda. Thank you, Andy. 
So that's the Mono Ferrarese now. Um, well, let's, let's look at it for ourselves, in fact. Let's take a look at the leaderboard and see how things have panned out after what was a really crucial race. Because Regatta Club Bodensee, they were the leaders going into that race. They got a seventh place. That relegates the Swiss now down to third overall on 31 points. And moving ahead of them, um, well, we saw them uh, win their race just now. That was uh, Varane Seglerhaus and Wannsee. And they are seemingly getting better and better, other Germans. And then Cecilo della Vallabari, who just spoke to Simone, Simone Ferraresi. Um, a very poor start in that race, but a great recovery. A bit of match racing applied at the windward mark on the Swiss and the Swedish. Um, and they moved up into second place in that race. And now, that now puts them in the lead overall. So the reigning champions from 2018 now leading qualifier two at uh, the uh, qualifier in Porto Cervo. So fantastic selling by them. Let's look at the, who's on the cusp of getting through. So Yacht Club Brighton-Burn, they got the OCS earlier today, but they followed up with the first. That leaves them just inside the top seven uh, with 45 points. And then just on the outside of the top seven um, are... The Estonians, just two points off qualifying. East team match race, Leeds. We haven't seen much of them so far today. Um, and then RR and ZV Massenroor last um, in their race just now, which drops them out of the qualification zone. So they need to come back strong. We see that they've managed to win races earlier in the series. And then Truk Pulsen from Czech Republic, they just won that race just now. They won the race before that, and their scores are definitely on the up. And they've got three more races, three more flights of racing to do over today and tomorrow. Will it be enough for the Czech Republic to continue to learn the ropes on the J70 and maybe do sufficient learning to be able to get into the top seven by the end of tomorrow's racing tomorrow afternoon? So that's the standings at the top of the board. Overall, we've got 16 nations and uh, 24 teams racing here, Corky. Well, interesting with us just pick up on truck pools, and they will be in this uh, first race, uh, race 37 of uh, Flight 13. Um, they'll be in this first race that we'll get to see. You can see uh, one other J17. No, they haven't lost their crew. That's uh, a spare boat anchored out there, ready to... Uh, rotate round if uh, if there was any damage to those boats but uh truck pulls and as I say two race wins in the last two uh flights question will be this first race if they can go out can they continue and uh, and claim another first and that's certainly going to help them move up that leaderboard well surely the confidence will be running high after winning their two previous races but it's so difficult to be consistent in this kind of racing we we see how marginal those uh, windward mark roundings are. You can be hero or zero in the blink of an eye. And uh, we, I was surprised to hear how confident Ferrarese felt about their windward mark rounding, but he clearly did feel that he had the control going around that windward mark and was able to exert penalties on some of the other boats around him. Um, yeah, I think from our, our situation, we were sat there trying to look at all at least six or seven boats all at the same time when if you're, you're tucked in, you're in your boat, you're locked in and you're looking at the boats nearest to you. And uh, and so I think that from the penalty, it was completely fair from where he felt, um, from where we were. We were trying to look from every single perspective of is that boat, is that boat, when actually uh, he, he was bang on the money with that. And again, penalties handed out and, and that's racing. You're going to put yourself in those positions. You're going to constantly push. Um, but you need to know exactly what the rules are going to do and how to use them in your favour. The yellow jerseys of Saro Boat Club uh, it doesn't mean that they're in the lead. It just means that they like wearing yellow. And uh, one of the sailors uh, d just uh, putting his uh, cap on there. He's actually an ex-America's Cup sailor. Uh, speaking to him yesterday, uh, Christian During, and... Uh, very experienced sailor who took a few years out while he had family and life got in the way. But at the age of 61, he's in great shape, as you can see, as he just walks forwards and uh, still absolutely loving his sailing. And while we're waiting for the next race to get underway, let's find out a little bit more about these sailing analytics, the SAP sailing analytics that help us do our job and help you at home also understand 
um, who's winning and why. Hello from the World Championships in Aarhus. I'm Axel Uhl, I'm with SAP, and my role here is to take care of the tracking. Back in 2011, we wanted to show just a single leaderboard for just a single race, and we thought we would have one user and one screen, and we would track one race or maybe two in a little regatta. Since then, we've been tracking a little more than 11,000 races, and we never thought that that would happen. We equip a lot of things around the race course with sensors. One thing is that we put a sensor on each mark and we put sensors on each boat. It's a couple of people that you need to operate something at that scale. It starts with just making sure that the infrastructure is working all right. So here we sometimes have around 20 servers up and running all the time to make sure that we really scale to the, to the amount needed. Sometimes trackers fail. We want to inform our partners to, for example, replace a tracker. Somebody drops a wind sensor into the water, the whole wind field information would get distorted by that. When something breaks, or if we're not available, or, or if we're not at an event, commentators tell us, what are we going to talk about? And then we say, like, look, this is the difference that we made. After all these years, people have become so accustomed to having that service available. So commentary is, is one of the key elements. You couldn't really comment on a sailboat race if you weren't able to use that technology. Well, thanks to Axel Uhl and the team at SAP who give us all that amazing data. Uh, Corky, you were out at the Finn Europeans in Athens last week, and, and you know how important uh, data and tracking is because you were actually tracking remotely from the UK, even though the event was in Athens. So it's amazing what modern technology can do, isn't it? It does. It opens up exactly what's going on with the racing. And for us here, we've got this uh, race underway, race one um, in uh, flight 13. But again, for all the picture here, for the viewers, you, you're just looking at a single picture. You're trying to identify those uh, boats on there. But from the track, you're suddenly able to dive down, look at the angles, the speeds, who those people are and where those boats are coming from. And so boat uh, number eight is the Estonian boat uh, closest to picture. They look like they've got a, a little bit of a, a gap away. And again, you can see boat one, five and six all starting to close together, squeeze together. And they are going to start to try and go into this high mode. So for this, now you suddenly look from this shot, they've got a bit of breathing space. Is it enough to be able to put attack in when that shift comes? Wait and see. But again, with all the tracking information, we've got the wind stats. We've got what the wind does. We also have... Uh, what figures out which way up this race course, looking at the wind data and where it go. And certainly there's a nice uh, shift coming in, which, ah, oh, perfect time. These guys obviously heard what I had said and uh, tacked out. But again, they're just trying to clear their air. You can see how tightly packed it is. And also just looking at uh, the boats now, there's actually quite a bit of seaway sort of moving around. A bit more movement across this water as this breeze has come up. These boats just pitching through that waves. And, uh, and that's what's given us the speed differences as well. It looks like the Estonians uh, in front of the picture there are struggling to hold the same line as, as the other boats. And they, they might, oh, yeah, they're, they're uh, Clearly. going through a little bit of chop there. They're, they're falling off compared with some of the other boats around them. So they're not in a position to be able to tack and cross. They're going to tack knowing that they're going to have to go behind these other boats. But the other boats are peeling away and suddenly the Estonians have clear air. So that's a bonus that they probably weren't expecting. And the way that all the boats have suddenly tacked suggests they feel they're already up on the port hand ley line. Now, the boat that was bounced out um, first out to the right-hand side uh, is one of the Polish boats, uh, the po Pogon Zhezhin. And uh, I wonder if that's going to play into their hands a bit more. At least they've got a bit of runway to play with, whereas there are five boats stacked hard up on the port hand ley line. And uh, it's, 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 I think it's going to be another congested windward mark. But again, sort of interesting looking at them, the, the, the poles are, are down by about five degrees compared with these boats sat up on the left-hand side. I've, the Polish are, are on a bearing of about 141 and uh, again, sort of about 135 squeezing up on this side. So at least five, six degrees difference sort of from that right side of the track to the left. And again, 
on one design boat, five degrees is a, a huge amount. Anything above that, then, you know, we, we always had a bit of a rule if it was a couple of degrees, depending on uh, whether it was a tactical situation of taking that tack or not. But if you're looking at anything from five degrees, you've got to be looking at taking that, certainly on these short courses. Yeah, and, and that uh, is absolutely borne out by that uh, tracker view that we had just then. Um, the Polish really not doing very well on the right-hand side, just not getting the best of the breeze. It looks a bit softer out that side. Um, and uh, the Swiss, sorry, the Swedish also up on that side of the course. But here are the port tackers, and there's going to be a real battle here. I think I'd probably want to be boat number two, the red boat on the left of picture. And uh, we're there with the uh, one of the Swedish boats, uh, Saro Boat Club, with boat number seven just over their shoulder. And uh, it's going to be tense moments as they approach the Wimber Mark. I think we're going to see another congested one. I wouldn't be surprised if we see some more penalties handed out well, you can at the top of the course. See on board, they're glancing down under the boom, and that's because Venska Siegelskapel there, the uh, boat number three, coming in, causing the issues of being on starboard now. Are boats going to try and peel in front of them? Are they going to take that manoeuvre? With boat seven being bounced around, this is... There's no way these boats are all getting around here cleanly. Will boat number one, as it goes round in the lead, actually get away with that? Or will they cop a penalty? Because there was all kinds of having to keep clear. I wouldn't want to be a jury member. I think I'd have to give everyone a penalty right now. Probably be the safest bet, wouldn't it? Sort of <laughs> it's, uh, but again, just picking up on uh, the Estonians there in the light blue that's match race leads. Uh, they were the ones that had to squeeze up in that middle. And I mean, put the anchors out and just stopped and caused everybody that uh, trying to work that space around. At some point, there's a red flag. Where is it being aimed? Is it towards the Estonian boat? It's we'll, the we'll leaders. Wait. It's the leaders, isn't it? Boat number one, all kinds of trouble because they're trying. Try uh, it wouldn't be my choice to do so. And I, I don't know why you feel the need to do that. I mean, you just give yourself a little bit more time to, to get the Jenica down. And, and I, I think maybe that's, that's a lack of practice. It's a lack of talking through your systems and your routines should you get the penalty. But surely, you know, surely just to, uh, to you know, you leave the sheet in fairly tight, you leave the bowsprit out and you literally just bang off the halyard and let 90% of it drop down into the, the hatch. Surely that's got to be the quickest route out. You, you would know. think so. But, I mean, what a giveaway by Orlansa segel Salskap at the Finnish team, giving away first place, dropping back to seventh. They probably didn't deserve to be in first place in the first place, if you know what I mean. But also behind them, you can see is the grey boat is uh, Naval uh, de Kashkai. Um, again, Vaskan Serpa spinning as well, um, picking up on his track. Uh, again, a penalty handed out for him, and it was the boat even further back. And uh, so now we can see nearly a distance from that front boat to him is over 150 meters gap, which uh, again, the uh, the punches keep coming. They do. Um, now, the purple, uh, the pinky purple boat closest to us, boat number five, Truck Pulsen the Czech Republic team that have been winning their previous two races. They didn't start so well. We're on board with them right now. A bit of pumping from the helmsman just to get a little bit of more power and a bit of surf off the small waves there. Working the boat really, really hard and um, in a good position again. They're not showing as being up in the lead, but uh, as we were looking at a really busy lured gate here now, and the Swedes already getting their Jenica down, ready to round. Are they going to be able to round clean ahead of the Polish boat? Looks like they managed to. So Swedes going round left and right. Sweden leads to the left. Sweden leads to the right. And then following round, Czech Republic just following KSS round on the near mark. On board with the Czech Republic, lying in second place, going out to the left-hand side. Probably third in this race right now. Saro Boat Club uh, with the yellow jerseys going out to the far right-hand side. And just picking up on that shot there from the drone, you can see boat number six squeezing round. That is uh, the Polish Pogon Sajansen. Uh Just taking that a hitch up. And it's amazing. Sort of we, we, we talk about great, you've gone round, you've led round that mark, but positioning out of a gate mark is just fundamental, isn't it? Certainly, you know, if you're able just to do that tight, do that golden one where I've, uh, say, 
I remember Jim Saltonstall and all the coaches I've had banging away on my ear is sort of stay out wide and come in tight around that mark. Well, that's exactly it. It's sort of coming out with your positions, if not more important than where you are actually in lined up and uh, being able to take that uh, tack back out. And so really interesting to see uh, it was the Estonians, the uh, match race lead, uh get pushed and they're sailing that uh, lighter line. So they had a light blue boat now just in shot. Um, boat number eight to the right of image. They took that shot and these are the boats around them were the ones that just came out even though they were behind them on the uh, gate mark, a better position. And so positioning was key around that gate mark. And now we get to see whose positioning is best on the race course. Will it be Sweden on the right or Sweden on the left who come in leading? That's the yellow jerseys of Surrow Boat Club on the right-hand side of the race course. How are they going to fare? We're on board with them right now. The wind they... flicking right now a little bit. So they're in a right-hand phase, slightly higher angle, but uh, it's got pretty much... Uh, the two Swedish boats uh, head on uh, collision at the moment, but obviously right of way with these guys here. They're the both approaching, uh, coming back towards the mid part of the course. So don't worry, that's not in the boat. Here's the two, the shot there of uh, the two Swedish boats as they approach each other. The lead line pretty much staying fairly neutral between them both. So critical point in the race for the two Swedish crews. Bjorn Hansen, the match racer, coming in from the left-hand side. He's been re leading this race up until this point. But in the parlance of match racing, will Zaro Boat Club have a piece of him? So now it's tense moments on board boat number three. Are they doing enough? Bjorn Hansen doesn't think so. They're going to have to tack. And we're into a classic match racing bounce-off there between the top two Swedish teams. But meanwhile, truck pulls are not involved in that match race. Also, perhaps able to start taking on the Swedes, but no, softening up a bit. So at the moment, the, the race for the lead is still between the top two Swedes. But Bjorn Hansen knows that he's in the disadvantaged position. He's closest to our screen, uh, but on the far side is Zaro Boat Club, who will be on to starboard tack earliest. And this surely is their final tack of the race if they've if they've judged it correctly but will Bjorn Hansen be able to get across no he's gone for his tack quite early and now will Bjorn Hansen control as they go around the Wimmer Mark it looks like Bjorn Hansen can hold his position so KSSS hold on to the lead and it's the Swedes from Saro Boat Club round in second and it's the Czech Republic truck pulls and just managed to shoot the mark get round in third place and the boats trucking in behind them are Estonia, followed by boat number four, which is uh, the other Polish team, uh, Pogon Zhezin. And a line of boats going around the mark much more cleanly than we saw in the previous race. Olanska Segod Salskapet from Finland going around in sixth place. They were leading this race until they took that disastrous penalty. So we'll the second Swedish boat be able to attack the lead of the leading Swedish boat, KSSS, skippered by Bjorn Hansen, the seasoned mat racer. I wouldn't want to have to take on Bjorn Hansen in a in a boat-for-boat boat mat race. He knows everything there is to know about these racing rules. Well, it's interesting if uh, you're a supporting boat of uh, JK Aurora. They uh, were making their way upwind, and look like uh, they were involved in a penalty. They look like they've taken one penalty and then gone into a second penalty. So whether they completed it properly and because of that have peeled out. So this is the fleet as you see it. They clearly were right behind uh, the fleet and whether uh, what those penalties were about. But I, I've, I've picked up they've potentially done two, possibly three on that last upwind leg. And because of that, it uh, looked like they've just headed straight down towards the finish and accepted that uh, it could be a retirement, whether there is uh, potentially uh, a breakage on that or whether they've just um, had enough. Who knows? But uh, certainly picking up that amount of penalties on that upwind leg, trying to just identify what they were and if there has... Um, I think there was uh, a port and starboard with uh, a Lanska Siegel Scapel. Um, they uh, looked like they potentially didn't cross cleanly there. 
Um, but it certainly looked like they've picked up a good few penalties. Jibing with Zaro Boat Club. KSSS had jibed away already, so now we're on a port starboard collision course between the two Swedish boats. Who's got the better of the breeze? KSSS were the leaders, and now they're on starboard jibe. Have they done enough to be able to get across Zaro Boat Club? It looks like Zaro Boat Club are going to, yeah, actually push the boat up behind the Swedes. So they've given away distance there. So I would say that makes KSSS safer for the win. Uh, but meanwhile, Czech Republic in the pink, also on the attack in the Czech Republic, winners of the previous two races that they've done with a chance maybe of being able to get back into second place. But I think KSSS at the moment in a good defensive position to be able to win the race. But the closer race, I think, is going to be between second and third. KSSS, the yellow boat just about to cross for the win. And then it's going to be a photo finish for second and third between the other Swedish boats and the Czech Republic. It looks like the tracker has given the second place to Zaro Boat Club and Czech Republic truck pulls in for third. And then fourth across the line is the light blue boat of the Estonians, followed on another photo finish by the green boat and the dark blue boat, the green boat being the, uh, the Polish and the dark blue boat being Cascais from Portugal. And then we've got Orlando Segel Salskapet somewhere in there. And also JK Aurora bringing up the rear. But anyway, a uh, KSSS, Bjorn Hansen and his crew managing to come out on top of a very, very close Swedish match race in that competition. And uh, I think it was a second place for these guys on board uh, Saro Boat Club. So still a very respectable score for them. Saro Boat Club with Tobias Bergqvist, Christian During, Bjorn Palmqvist, and Lisa Riedbacken. That's Lisa Riedbacken right there about to step off the boat. And there'll be a switch over of teams. Hard to tell with this crew. They've not exactly got their, uh, their team colours together. So we'll see who's on board this boat in a moment when they break out their ID flag. Oh, it looks like the Brits. Looks like it's Wessex Exiles. Well, they can barely scrape enough money together for a pizza. So it's not surprising that uh, they haven't managed to get the team gear together. The Wessex Exiles fighting for one of these top seven places. It's the top seven that will qualify from Porto Cervo, the second of these three qualifiers this season that go through to the Sailing Champions League final in Samaritz at the end of August. The Union Jack finally flying on the back of this boat. And we're looking to get an interview with someone from the winning boats, KSSS. We'll switch over to Bjorn Hansen now. So Bjorn, if you can hear me, congratulations. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, it, was a, it was a tight race for sure. We were extremely tight at the top mark. We were fortunately on starboard tag coming in and uh, three boats were trying to squeeze between us and the marks. And... Uh, I don't know, at least one boat got a penalty, so that uh, gave us a little bit room to breathe, but uh, still very tight all the way around the course. Yes, and it was uh, a Swedish 1-2 for very much of that race, and when the other Swedish team broke out to the right-hand side of the course, how concerned were you that you'd given up control on the next port starboard crossing? Well, uh, not too much actually, because we thought that the left-hand side was better breeze-wise. Um, we would have liked to, to, to round the other gate mark down here and go for attack, but they were inside us, so we changed our mind and went to the, to the left-hand mark instead. Uh, but then coming up, it was uh, decided that we should go before the ley line, before the port ley line. So if they could uh, reach us, we had time to tack outside the zone. But they also came out short of their uh, starboard ley line. And they just managed to take out on, 
take us on a star starboard port situation. So uh, we came pretty close to the zone in the end from port, but they overstood the mark a little bit, so we managed to squeeze inside and round uh, ahead of them. But, uh, you know, down the last run, it was five or six boats just on our hip. So uh, we decided to jibe in early and uh, later have the starboard advantage when we came back uh, close to the finish line. Bjorn, even though you're in a fleet race, how much does your match racing experience help you in these close quarters situations? I think it helps me quite a lot, but I lead, need to learn to have more margin that I ha than I have. Because, you know, in a match race, we have one umpire boat and just two, uh, two boats racing. So they can be much closer to the situation than they, than, uh, they can be here. Uh, so it's quite hard for the umpires to, to see the, the situations, really. So uh, that means that uh, you can't rely on getting the correct calls all the time uh, because they are often not in the correct position. Yeah, there's many, many different places that the umpires need to be looking all at once. And uh, at those windward marks, it seems like you need one, one umpire for every boat on the race course. Uh, but if you didn't have those umpires, um, <laughs> it would be chaos, wouldn't it? It would be like anarchy oh. out there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The, this would not be possible without the umpires, for sure. I mean, we would sitting, be sitting in the protest uh, hearing room all night otherwise. So, I mean... Uh, we, we, the sailors just have to accept that uh, sometimes the uh, umpires make uh, a mistake, but on the other hand, the sailors do three times as many mistakes as the umpires. So, so I mean, they are still the best guys on the on the race course out here. Bjorn, it seems like your crew wants to get back to the Matilda and fill themselves up with pasta, but we're enjoying talking to you, so I, I think they can wait a little bit longer. <laughs> um, but I'm just a bit concerned about your sun yeah, factor. Definitely. What, what strength of sun factor sun cream are you oh, using? Oh, you are? <laughs> the same as this microphone. <laughs> I, I, can't tell, I can't tell the difference. I think that microphone was made from your skin. <laughs> oh, I, I'm probably only pumped up after that race, so that's why I'm red. Uh, <laughs> so I don't see a problem with the sun, though. <laughs> well, no, but I just want to add that... Uh, I just want to add that the, the crew did a fantastic job in this last race. They really managed to keep us in front. I mean, it was like seven hungry wolves chasing us around the race course. So uh, they uh, deserve their, their, their uh, time in fame as well. So uh, uh, big thanks to, to and congratulations to my crew. Okay, well, that's very good of you to say so, Bjorn. And uh, you better get your crew back to their bowl of pasta. And you, for yourself... Just please put some more sun cream on before the next race. Okay, I promise. That's tomorrow, and it's raining tomorrow. <laughs> Thanks, Bjorn. Great to talk to you, and congratulations on your race win. Yeah, thank you very much. So, Bjorn Hansen, uh, very pleased with his crew, um, even though his crew didn't show the same patience or respect for him. But uh, no, clearly there's, there's good team spirit amongst that team. And uh, good sailing by the Swedes all round, taking the top two places in that race. Well, again, uh, yeah, we, you just have to look at some of the calibre of the sailors that uh, are dotted in and around this fleet. We, you know, um, a lot of people just think this fleet is, is based with a lot of people from, from the home clubs coming up, sort of students, all sorts of bits. But actually, you know, there's, uh, of course the full depth within all of the clubs from where people have grown up and, and come back and to have these names in, in the actual same Champions League really brings a precedence to what level of sailing is going on on the water. It isn't just a, like a, a university student racing sort of body. It's, a, you know, these are world-class renowned sailors. Um, and, of course, some of the sailors out there are, you know, enjoying having the battles against these these giants of the sport. So uh, um, I think it's a, a pretty amazing bit, and it creates, in a way, the most neutral playing field for them. Yeah, I think so. And it's very brave of uh, top sailors to put themselves in such an even fight like this. Uh, they, it really leaves the, their reputations very exposed 
if they don't come out of these competitions well. But anyway, Bjorn Hansen, one of the best match racers in the world, certainly showed a clean pair of heels to the fleet in the race that we've just seen. And in fact, uh, that was their last race of the afternoon. So um, it may not just be Pasta in, um, uh, on board the good ship Matilda. Maybe the Swedes will be able to go back to Yacht Club Costa Smeralda for some well-earned Pasta there. Um, so uh, the winners of the, uh, the various leagues around the, the Baltic countries uh, that take part in the national sailing leagues, they also earn the right to take part in the Nord Stream race, which is an intriguing 1,000-mile race through the Baltic Sea. It was a big adventure. It was a fantastic experience for me. Once in a lifetime opportunity again. So the Nord Stream race, I've followed that race through the Baltic uh, for the last two summers. And so you take the best sailors from their countries out of these J-70s and you put them on board multi-million dollar Club Swan 50s and, and push them out onto the big wide ocean or anyway, the Baltic Sea and send them racing from uh, Kiel to Copenhagen to Stockholm to Helsinki and the finish in St. Petersburg. So imagine getting really good at J70 racing and then suddenly you get the keys to a 50 foot race yacht and you can sail that a thousand miles through the Baltic Sea. And where might that lead? It could lead to competing in, in the next Volvo Ocean Race or the Ocean Race as they call it now. Who, who knows where these opportunities can lead and some, sometimes uh, you've got to join the dots in your racing career. These guys on board Wessex Exiles, the, the British, will be thinking in those terms. If we do well here, what opportunities, what doors will open for us somewhere else in the sailing world? And that's it. The, the sports uh, really kind of just opened a, a huge number of doors. Before, there was a, a very clear path. You, you go down the Olympic route, and then once you've been successful, you then lead on to the Cup and, and, and Volvo Ocean Racing and so on. When now, you know, with the, the keelboat scenes, many of them having uh, keelboat squads, um, it's, uh, it's an amazing to see what's actually... Um, available to the sailors out here. But uh, this is Flight 13. This is going to be Race 38. The next race is presented by One Ocean Foundation. One minute to the start. Flag just comes down on the committee boat, and the weather is still holding good for the final couple of races that we'll be reporting on this afternoon. Well, uh, a change on this is we have uh, got the breeze just slightly moving around towards uh, that right hand side. Um, due to that, a bit of a starboard end bias this time. So, are we going to see the, a bit more of a bunch towards that side? Our boat's going to protect that. There we go. All the boats are sitting up towards the uh, committee boat end. So, a bit more of a gap of a runway towards that pin end, but still with uh, a little bit of time, 20 seconds, they can still eat up a bit more of that space uh, towards the pin end. But you don't want to be just giving that distance away for no reason. We've got some top teams competing in this one. Some of the ones to watch out for are SRR. We were just on board with them. Um, we've got Vasa Segel Vereining from Germany. They're in second overall. Just crossed the line now. An individual recall flag's gone up. Uh, saw it at the front on the committee boat. So uh, whether it is on those lead boats. Oh, it's, it is. It's boat number two that's going back round again. That's Wessex Exiles, the Young Brits. And we're on board with them now, so a uh, bit of a misjudgment there by the young British crew, and that's going to be hard for them to come back from there. 
Yeah, that's uh, see straight away now onto the back foot and and with a race course that with that breeze moving slightly towards that right hand side, they're going to have a lot of boats starting to tack out. So you've got three boats already slap bang on top of them, going to be shoveling that uh, disturbed air off the back of those sails, and so that's going to be a really horrible place to chew your way through again. Yeah, it's a long way back for the Brits if they're going to get out of last place. On this side of the course, we've got boat six against boat seven. But we've got quite a split. But boat six is uh, Kreuzlingen from Switzerland. Uh, they are fourth overall in the uh, competition at the moment. And then Monze is boat number seven. That's the boat that they will be watching most closely at the moment. They're in 14th at the moment. So Kreuzlingen, definitely the, uh, the, the higher form boat between these two. Uh, but at the moment, oh, well, as I say that, uh, boat number seven is tacked now. Boat number six, Kreuzlingen, skippered by, I think it's Tom Rug. I'll check that. Um, it is Tom Rug, ex-49er sailor. I used to race the 49er against him back in the day. Um, wearing the uh, the yellow and the black there. And big <laughs> hiking going on by the guys at the front, really committing to putting every bit of body weight and extra writing moment into the sailing that they can. So Kreuzlingen out on what has tended to be the favoured left-hand side. Bjorn Hansen in the interview just now said that he always felt comfortable being the boat out on the left because he thinks that's where the best breeze is. And that's always how it looks from our drone shot. But I'm, I'm aware of the fact that that's always the side of the, the, uh, the race course we're looking at. So that can be a little bit deceptive. Yeah, I'd say sort of a, a bit more of a neutral start line, maybe even a, a small advantage to that committee boat. And But uh, again, breeze is fairly st uh, steady across the course. A little bit more of this left phase kicking back in again. And so uh, that's uh, enabling sort of these boats to creep in from that left-hand side. But we are still... <laughs> Definitely mid-left is where you kind of be wanting to protect. I think you're fairly solid in there. All it is is about defining and making a clear decision on where that gap is coming in at that windward mark. Not being too bold and going, well, I get there's half a boat length, I'm going to attack in there. You know, uh, being basically bold with it, going into, as we talked about, that catamaran sort of approach. I'm going to just carry on straight across, tack one boat length above the ley line. So it enables any boats coming in on starboard to dip on the inside, and you're less likely then to pick up that penalty. But uh, when you try and fit three or four of each boats all round in the same space, we've seen uh, time and time again, it doesn't happen. Now we're getting to the crunch point. Let's hope it's not literally the crunch point, but the ports and starboards are beginning to converge on each other. And now it's squeaky bottom time for boat number six and boat number seven. Have they done enough? on port tack to be able to get across the starboard tackers. At the moment, Looking it good. looks like they might well do that. So the power of the left looks to be playing in the favour of the Swiss and the Austrians who might just get across. Austria might be in a bit of trouble, boat number seven, but boat number six certainly looking good. So Kreuzlingen in the lead, and it looks like boat number seven, um, Monze, also do just enough to tack in front of Vasa segel Vereining. So that's the cleanest Wimbledon Mark rounding we've seen in a while, I think. No incidents so far. So Switzerland, Austria, Finland, round in the top three. I was saying that all looked fairly, fairly standard Mark rounding then. That, that everyone's behaved themselves on that one. So, uh, but around they go. But you can see how tightly packed it is. And again, your position out of this mark is vital. Do you sit on that slightly lower line? Are you able to get that uh, jibe in early? Are you looking to have that position? We can see uh, right out towards the uh, right-hand side. There oh. is, uh, I say, sort of we're picking up on the Yacht Club. Uh, Mordensee has gone very high on that right-hand side. The kite doesn't look like it's in the greatest of shapes there and crew members being stood up. So it's... Uh, um. And just going around the mark, Wessex Exile Sailing Club in eighth place. And not showing much sign of being able to catch the rest of the fleet. That's how far back they are and not managed to make any inroads on the, uh, on the top, on the rest of the fleet. Uh, so I think Wessex Exile is very much relegated to the back for the duration of th this race. So here, this was, uh, as we were just picking up, is uh, Yacht Club Modernsea. 
and supposedly they are OCS. This is why. So Spinnaker's come down. There's Jib rolled up. So not only we saw the British go back at that start, they might have still been over and cleared their names and have come back into that race. Or they might have done that uh, prematurely and it was actually the Austrian Union uh, Yacht Club Moldensee that have just been uh, notified at that top mark, which is now, you look on the left of the tracker, appealing off. So we are down to a seven-boat race. Well, there's a small consolation for Wessex Exiles bringing up the rear and, and maybe they didn't need to go back or maybe there were two boats that were, that were over. Certainly the Brits looked pretty poked out on the line as well. But that will be really disappointing for Monze. Their chances of being able to get into the top seven will really slip away with that OCS that they've just suffered um, just now. Um, so that's going to drop them further down the rankings. Just about to go around in the lead is Kreuzlingen, Tom Ruger and the Swiss. A little bit late getting the... Jennica away, but uh, not too bad. They're not under too much pressure right now. That's about as good a lead as we ever see in these short races. Now it's a lot harder for going around for the next few. And coming around close to us is the uh, the dark blue boat, uh, boat number one. It's RR and ZV Massenruhr from the Netherlands. So a good rounding for them. And one surprise for me is that the leading Swiss have decided to go right, having done so well from being on the left-hand side up. So I wonder what Tom Rugg and his team have seen out on the right-hand side, which has tended to be the less popular place to go. Yeah, I'd, 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 I think potentially it's sort of the way they've come downwind. You're so tightly packed with... Uh, where boats were trying to get round that mark and uh, where that jibing angle came in. It's one less jibe. They didn't have to go for another manoeuvre or a jibe drop on that gate mark. So you accept that you might uh, be forced out a little bit towards the right. But we're not talking big race courses here in the sense that if you're normally forced out and you commit yourself to one side, you're, you're pretty stuck there. Here they could take that tack back, come back towards that right. But... Um, with the broom space at the moment, there's a nice left shift, so it's uh, favoured on that port hand uh, tack. So the boats that, even though they're going out towards the right, the boat that are actually on that port hand tack are on the lifting tack. So we see there on that drone shot, the three in the back of picture are on the lifting tack. So the bulk of the fleet all on the actually a, a knocking tack here. So there, the gain is towards that right. But of course, if that breeze doesn't shift back and hold, the advantage spins back towards the boats on this left side. Well, Corky, that certainly seems to bear out what you were just saying. It looks like the, the right is looking a lot better than it has tended to do. And RR and ZV on the far left uh, rounded in probably third place. It still has them ranked as third place, but it looks like maybe they've actually given away quite a lot of distance. The, the other factor being that the left hand rounding at the bottom, the gate mark on the left, was also further to sail. So there were it seems many good reasons for the Swiss to break the usual mould of the leader going to the left. The Swiss have gone to the right and they've further extended their lead and they look extremely comfortable on the boats on their left. So this is going to be a relatively straightforward win, I think, for Kreuzling and, and Tom Rugg's crew. Yeah, and it's, uh, they're pretty comfortable up in front and again, without uh, any silly boat handling errors, this should just be a, a, an easy run to the finish line. They've got a, lots of breathing space. Um, and again, without the pressures around them, hopefully you shouldn't see any uh, silly mistakes going in. Yeah. So um, as things stand, uh, a race win here certainly be a lot better than their sixth place in their previous heat. And it would put them up into the top four. So good score for them so far. Uh, whereas Vanze, um, they are in sixth in this. They were formerly our... Uh, that they were vying for the lead. They're still doing very well. They're in third overall where they stand at the moment, but a six not particularly great for them. I mean, while Monze, who were doing well early in this race, they've been pulled out because they were over the line at the start and Wessex Exiles uh, playing catch up after going back. But a very straightforward hoist here for Tom Rug and his crew under no pressure at the moment from anybody on the final run to the finish. And just behind them, you can see SRR, amongst them some really top 49er sailor, sailors on the French team. SRR just about to go round uh, in second place. 
And behind them, the Dutch who went out to the left-hand side, RR and ZV, Mass and Raw in boat number one, going for a very deep bear away and then a set, trying to get the inside line on the French, seeing if they can attack for second place. Next boat round, boat number eight is Yacht Club Breitenbrunn. The thing that surprises me here is that with such a strong dominance towards that right-hand side, why the jibe didn't come in early and, and, and get away from these boats and already position yourself there? Because you can see the lower angle now being soaked by these boats. Uh, we can see the French boat taking that jibe early and actually goosewing that sort of kite over to try and gain some depth and uh, close the distance and uh, force a bit of a, a mistake from the Swiss. There's a big gap between them still, so it's uh, going to need some difference. But uh, I would have been... Uh, bit more protective over that sort of side or maybe just going for that jibe slightly earlier um, just to uh, again just bank that position again always just banking what you gain making those gains well to uh, feeling the pressure loads of space but um, again it'll be uh, an interesting one to see uh, how the French have done they've now come out of that uh, position but they've held a really nice low line and now sit on the inside of that little pack just uh, just behind the leaderboard uh, we haven't seen much of that goose swinging, um, but that looked like it worked really well for the French there. So they basically held their Jenica on starboard jibe, but they threw the boom across. So they they had the the uh, the mainsail on port jibe, and they had the Jenica on starboard jibe, and that allowed them to gain some depth on the Dutch boat attacking them. And a again, it's it's that classic sort of uh, match racing sort of manoeuvre, isn't it? It's all about positioning, trying to position yourself to think, right, in the next two, three positions here, I need to be jibing. I want to be coming into this finish line on star, but I want to be the one nearest the mark to give me the room at the mark. And and again, that's exactly the position they're in now. So uh, they've got a boat just to uh, to windward of them that they've got to hold on. Um, and we, I think, looking at... Yeah, that is the leaders. So that is Tom Rug and Segler... Vereniging Kreuzlingen with a really, really comfortable lead here. About to cross the finish line in, I would say, this would be the most dominant victory that we've seen all day today. It's been much harder fought, but this has been a really easy race for the Swiss. And it all comes back to a good start off the pin end of the line, being able to tack fairly early, a good race win, very solid, well-deserved high fives for the... Swiss team representing Kreuzlingen. That's Tom Rug, Michael Herrmann, Jens Lichtblau and Stefan Staheli. Coming across the line in second place of the French from La Rochelle. They hold on for second by the attacking Dutch team who have to settle for third. And then it's going to be Brunn, looking like they're lining up for fourth place for Austria. And then it's going to be very, very close on the line. Will the green boat be able to just take it from yellow? It might well have done. So Vasa segel Ferening have just stolen a place off Vansi, who get a sixth. And sixth is actually Vansi's worst finish in the uh, regatta so far. I mean, it's the only, the only other time they finished outside the top three. It was a fifth place on Thursday. Uh, so uh, we're going to try and speak to those guys from... Vonse in a moment, um, but uh, that that will come up. But it will be interesting to find out what went wrong for them in that race because they've been so consistent in their other races. Bear in mind, uh, winning here is not the be all and end all. It's it's about getting a top seven finish. The top seven of these twenty four teams here in Portocello secure a place to compete in the grand finals in Samaritz at the end of August. That's what really matters. But of course, there's a bit of ego and a bit of pride riding on the line in these races too. Yeah, again, it's it's you, you're not going to obviously compete against all of these uh, these clubs when. Um of course, as we've just identified, there is only going to be those top few that will uh, go through. But it is your chance to start to kind of scope out who's going to be a major threat. You've you've obviously got the Italians with uh, Giacolo della Vellabari, who previous winners of it. They won here as well. This is a comfortable place for them to, uh, they feel very at home here. And, um, and again, 
you start to work out who could be your threats. But again, it's every time you go on the water, you want to win. It's plain and simple, isn't it? That competitive side of things. But there is, in a longer term uh, strategy, is you need to get one of your qualification spots. You need to put yourself on that start line in San Moritz. And that's where the battle's going to really commence. It, it's about uh, being slow and steady with your approach. Obviously, you're not being slow in the boat, but um, strong and stable. Um, and tortoise and hare. <laughs> <laughs> More being the tortoise, less the hare. Not not being so greedy, being patient, and uh, just waiting your moments. And uh, I'm always impressed by uh, whenever we speak to Simone Ferraresi. Um, the Italians are normally uh, um, what you consider to be the the the, the red blooded, hot headed, hot headed Europeans. But uh, Ferraresi always seems so calm and collected, and and very together with his thoughts and emotions. Well, uh, again, you've got so many races, aren't we? Look, we're in flight 13 and uh, going into this, and this is race 39. So all of the teams will have completed 13 races at the end of this. Well, there is no discard. There is no point to where you can just let that head gasket go. You've got to keep a lid on it. You've got to be able to reset. There's, we know that at each mark, you could be going around in second place. It only takes the first boat to stuff up the mark and, trying to shoot the mark and put the brakes on and everyone bundles up and you could go from first, second, third, right down to uh, sixth, seventh and eighth. And so uh, your race can turn around very quickly and it's about that mental resilience, being able to reset and, uh, and go through it. And if you get your head around that and you're able to keep a, a fairly clean sheet, but also be able to just reset when the pressure really hits, then um, I think you're in a good place. Uh, the Swedes, they're generally pretty level-headed. Uh, this is uh, the team from Huvik's Boat Club. Victor Kukjeman, Per Alexanderson, Mikko Johnson and Johan Mosberg. But I believe that we have a chance of speaking to uh, someone from the German team uh, from Vunzi Yacht Club. Hello. And who am I speaking to? Yes, this is Tim. Hi, Tim. It's Andy uh, here. This is Tim. I'm the helmsman of the team. Hi. So, uh, Tim, you, you're a bit you, hard to understand. Uh, Tim, if you can hear me, uh, you've had a fantastic regatta so far. Uh, you're lying in third place overall, but that was a difficult race for you. What was uh, so hard about the race just now? Um, I think nothing special. Uh, the conditions are. Uh, quite choppy, so you have to be careful not to stop the boat too much. And uh, shortly after the start, we didn't manage that so well, so we maneuvered ourselves in a bit blocked situation, which was just a cause for not being in the top at the top mark. Um, but in general, I think all the races are pretty hard, and um, yeah, we're uh, really happy with our performance uh, so far. And uh, even with uh, with the place from the last race, we're still happy and uh, looking forward to the next two races to uh, finish here in uh, of Sardinia. Tim, can you hold the microphone as close to your mouth as possible, like like a uh, a rap star would do? Thank you. Um, and uh, yeah, so we'll do. <laughs> what are you going to do for the rest of the day? Because you're, you're done with racing now, right? How are you going to enjoy your time in uh, Costa Smeralda for the rest of the day? Uh, well, we haven't thought about it. We thought maybe there's going to be more races today. But uh, when this was a final race, uh, well, I think we're going to look at the beautiful landscape here, sit on the terrace and uh, just relax a bit to be prepared for tomorrow morning. Um, and uh, when you've managed to win these races, what do you think has been the winning move for you in the races where you've really done well? Uh, the start is always very important, so if you get a clean shot from the starting line and you can do what what you want to do on the top uh, top leg then that's perfect and uh, it's also fine if you come second or third if you're close to the other ones you still have options left during the race so for tomorrow again good starts and uh, speed on the first leg that's important and how much luck is involved at the windward mark whether you get a penalty or not
difficult one. We managed to go uh, through the regatta without a penalty on the top mark, so I'm pretty happy about that. Um, I think it's always tight because if you come from the outside you want to take a tight lay to get the other boats not to tack inside. But as a result, if they can tack, then it's going to be a standing race at the top mark. So we, we try to stay out of it. Well, Tim, I think that's a fantastic statistic that you haven't actually managed to get a penalty yet. So I wish you the best of luck with your remaining races tomorrow. And um, I hope you manage to keep a clean sheet around those women marks and avoid penalties for the rest of the regatta. Congratulations and well done with your performance. Thank you. Thank you. See you later. So that was Tim Elsner and his team representing Varein Seglerhaus am Wannsee. And we're going to go back shortly to the next race in this flight. Back on board with the Swedish. And this, this, these are the Swedes we've seen the least of so far out, out on the, uh, the racetrack. And uh, they're in 18th place overall. They actually won the first race of uh, their regatta back on Thursday. Um, but they've only had one other uh, finish in the, uh, the, in the top four, actually. So they've, they've got a first and a second, and they've had a bunch of uh, finishes uh, that tended to be at the back of the fleet. So they, at the moment, are looking far out of contention for going through uh, to the finals in San Moritz, which is a shame for them after... They, they must have thought after winning the first race of the regatta, they, they, they must have thought, we're in with the shout here, but it hasn't worked out that way for them. So I'll just give you a rundown of the other teams that are going to be racing in this particular um, heat. It's going to be the Swedes we just talked about, Huvix Boat Club, from France, we have Société de Regate du Havre. Uh, we have Ciccolo della Verabari leading the series overall and are reigning champions from last year. They're the Italians. Sailing Club Nauticus from Lithuania. From Norway, we have Lavik Sail for reigning. From the Netherlands, Kayan and Arvi Muiden. From Poland, Odyssey Sailing Club. And from Switzerland, Reg Regatta Club Bodensee, who are lying in second overall. So the interesting race for me will be between Boat 7, that's Regatta Club Bodensee, and Cercolo della Velabari Boat 4. Boat 4 and Boat 7 are the two boats to watch. So just looking at the uh, the wind and uh, the conditions out on that water. Again, we've seen this uh, fairly consistent nine, top of nine, sort of 10, 11 knots of breeze and uh, still out on that race course. Got a, just coming up to about 11 knots of breeze. Fairly stable again. We have seen this uh, breeze slowly clock round towards the right as the day's gone on. A little bit of a, a skewer, of course, it has moved around, but that's where we're starting to see this right become a little bit more favoritism. The start line, a little bit of a, a right-hand bias, but nothing really too significant. So you're going to start to define where you want to be going on this race course um, and where you're coming up. Um, but again, this is uh, that final race, Flight 13, Race 39. <laughs> The next race is presented by One Ocean Foundation. So one minute 20 to the start. No boats in shot other than the committee boat itself. And there with the overhead shot, we see the boats playing around some way below the line at the moment. So not lining up particularly early for this one. Hard to see the, with the pattern of play or, or which end of the line they want. But now it's beginning to become more apparent with less than one minute to go. It looks like most of the boats want the committee boat end of the line. Yeah, they're all starting to bundle up into that right side. All starting to be a bit more protective. Bows going down. 
Uh, we can see boat number four, which is uh, Chiricolo della Vellabari, trying to hold the lured boats that potentially go into uh, a double tack and just going into high mode now to close those boats off, hold that position. So they've made it really clear of where they want to be. They want to be the boat coming off towards this pin end. Doesn't mean they will want to attack that mark, but it means they can hold their position, hold all the other boats in position until they want to hit that accelerator. On board with a Swedish boat right now. And boat number eight looking dangerously close to the line with just 10 seconds to go. That's the Dutch from Sweden. So the Dutch in a really difficult, sticky bind there. Meanwhile, Chocolo della Vellabari able to accelerate along the line and turn the boat up whenever they want. Boat number four closest to us. They are the series leaders, the reigning champions of the Sailing Champions League, getting exactly the start that they wanted. And now they have to fight to be able to be able to burn off some of the boats further up to windward because boat number two, the next boat up for them, also in a good controlling position. But um, also a great start further up the line um, by the, I can't quite tell what number it is. It's sort of the yellowy green color. And... It's uh, Société des Regates du Havre, the French team, with a fantastic start, middle right out of that line. It surprised me there from the Italians. You can see the gap they've kind of created um, away from the Swedish boat, sort of positioning themselves down towards that left. You, you could see they were in a really commanding position. No one could put the bows down and accelerate until they did. And they went really early with a good 10 seconds to go, which ate up that distance they had towards that pin end. And because of that, we see the, the Swedes just uh, hold off that little lane a little bit later on. And so, yes, now they're starting to creep bow forward. They've got that little bit of gap. But I potentially wouldn't have wanted to have lost that sort of distance and sat myself just up underneath that bow because they still had commanding position of when to pull that trigger. Yes, I mean, they, they pulled the trigger and there was certainly a maximum speed when they crossed the line, but they'd given away valuable distance to the right by doing so. And I, I think... Uh, uh, probably Farrarese will be regretting that a little bit. I mean, they're still in a good position. They've, they've still got good breeze, but they could have been in a much more controlling position than they are right now. Yeah, I don't think that's going to be uh, detrimental to their race in any way with uh, where they've come off from that line, but uh, would have given them a little bit more. Look how much, and just glancing over that right shoulder, whether they've got that chance, whether they can get that tack in, when can they go? And in a way, this wouldn't be so much of a problem as if not spending more time looking over that back shoulder. And as soon as they go, they're simultaneously now going. And potentially would have had the lead early on. Regatta Club Bodensi then just going in underneath them as well. And uh, in quite a strong position when they come back across on starboard at that uh, top mark. So um, again, yeah, could uh, we now connect the dots a little bit from that start and uh, giving that distance away could end up uh, creating a bit of a situation at this win with Mar, but we'll, we'll find out as they approach in from this left side. Further over to the right, we're on board with Juvik's Boat Club from Sweden, um, sailing pretty nicely right now. Tobias Bergqvist steering that boat, and they are going along very nicely, but we're back now looking at the Italians fighting to get over the top of boat number two. Uh, that's uh, Juvik's Boat Club, the uh, who we're just on board with. So... Uh, a good battle going on between those two boats and some hard hiking going on on board the Italian boat. And it looks like the Swedes are managing to edge up towards the Italians. So are the Italians able to keep their air clean there? And we see the starboard tackers beginning to come over. But the boat uh, just out of picture now ahead of the Italians is Regatta Club Bodensee in tactically the strongest position right now. The Italians... Not in a bad place, but they might have a lot to do as they get closer to this swim of Mars. I was going to say, they're in a dangerous position. They're trying to put the bow down and roll over the Swedes because they need to clear that, what we call a little safety bubble. That 25% safety bubble of them just down to Leward. Uh, they're going to have all these boats come rattling in on the right. And to pitch up and find a gap is going to be very difficult. The Swedes can hold them there. Of course, if they have to duck, they've got to provide space for them to go as well. But I think the uh, Italian is going to get closed off at this mark pretty hard. So maybe they're just going to have to fight their way through and accept they're going to take a penalty. Round goes uh, Regatta Club Bodensee in the lead, followed by boat number three. 
which is a Societe de Regat du Havre, followed by boat number five, Sailing Club Nauticus. But how is it going for the Italians? It seems like they've just about managed to get around. He got round in uh, fourth, uh, fifth place there, uh, but they were just right in front of uh, the Norwegians. And uh, whether the Norwegians felt they were impinged at that point, the attack didn't seem uh, completely clear of their distance. But again, we'll see what the umpires think of that. So is it going to be a clean rounding for the whole fleet? The Unheard of, isn't it? <laughs> almost, almost today. Look how high uh, the uh, the boat is over on far right. They they look like they're in a terrible position when they come back over. Oh no, but it's the Cité de Regat du Havre. They've been pulled out of the race, and uh, so the French were OCS at the start line. Uh, but meanwhile, up at the front of the fleet, uh, I think it's Regatta Club Bodensee that's actually in the lead. So uh, an early. Early shower for the French team as they head off the race course and uh, will continue their route back. And a uh, nice little jibe out here from Regatta Club Bodensee. Again, that early jibe out, the nice thing is when they come in towards this gate mark, they are going to be coming back across on star, but it puts them on that inside track where the difficult position here for the same club, Nauticus, they are, the Lithuanians here, going to have to uh, pick their way through and look for that inside line. But with the uh, the Dutch team, KNZ and RV Muden, they're going to hold that inside line on that uh, gate mark. So uh, looking at the breeze again, fairly steady. We've got 11 knots uh, consistent still across that race course. But very, very close. And uh, we're going to see if we can get hold of Hinnock out on the water. Hinnock, can you hear us? And if you can, uh, what do you know about the OCS situation? Uh, yes, I hope you can hear me. Uh, it was uh, quite late pulling out the uh, yellow boat. It's the uh, second downwind now. And I, oh no, it's the first downwind now. And I think, yeah, pulling out them earlier would be nicer for them. But uh, as you saw on the start, it was really close, really tight. And uh, I saw the individual recall coming up. And yeah, no boat returned. So it was probably the French boat coming out and now pulling up the, uh, of the race. And Henrik, which has the best side for the breeze on the second beat, do you think? Um, on the downwind, we saw, uh, yeah, same as before, the left upwind side, because uh, the rock shape here influenced the wind a lot and we see all the gusts coming from the left hand side and the right, like in the drone picture, a little bit uh, more loud. So we again see uh, most of the boats now going left. But um, yeah, we see a small change now on the, on the right side, it's more lift and uh, maybe some more wind coming in, but it looks pretty even for me now. Okay, Henrik, thank you very much. And we've got a bit of a split going on at the moment. We've got boat number eight, KNZ and RV Muiden, coming out to the left-hand side. But in the top of picture, in the distance, it's still Regatta, Regatta Club Bodensee who holds the lead. And it looks like a, quite a healthy lead right now. Yeah, it's looking pretty comfortable for that. And uh, this, uh, where it, well, where it sees them at the moment, uh, I'm sure... They will uh, squeeze up a little bit further up onto this uh, leaderboard, but this would keep them up into second place um, overall after this. This is the uh, last race which would fill out the final flight, uh, flight 13. Um, we talked about that they've kind of gained a couple of flights just to ensure that uh, going into tomorrow due to the in bit of uncertainty of what this uh, rain's going to bring and um, what the forecasts are telling us, then... Um, it leaves us two flights to complete and who's going to come out on top. So it's quite, it'll be quite a, an interesting one. The sailors uh, will come off the water. They'll reflect a little bit on, on how their racing was going. Uh, sit, sit in and around the club, just try and uh, clear out what's uh, happening on the um, those last two races. But you've got two more races to either secure two points or 16 points. So uh, there's quite a big range still to move through. 
on the right of picture, Cercolo della Velabari. Um, they've had their difficult moments in this race, but they seem to be holding second place in this race behind Regatta Club Bodensee. So it's the top two boats in the series overall that are the top two boats um, in this race right now. It's just that their positions are reversed. But the way things stand, the points are tightening up. So this is an important one for Regatta Club Bodensee to be leading if they want to win this qualifier because they are getting closer and closer to the, uh, the points of Cercolo della Velabari. Regatta Club Bodensee on to their tack there and about to round the windward mark for the final time with a very, very nice lead for the Swiss. Up goes the grey and white Jenica. Out goes the pole. Kite snaps into action and behind them are the Italians, Cecolo della Velabari and a very tight battle for third, fourth and fifth coming up behind. So it looks like it could get busy at the windward mark coming up. Let's keep with the windward mark for a while while the Italians go round in second place. That will cement their position at the top of the leaderboard, provided they can hold on to that. And then it starts getting a lot busier as they come round the windward mark for third, fourth and fifth. Round is boat two. And that's Huvix Boat Club from Sweden, boat eight is the Dutch. Boat five is Sailing Club Nauticus from Lithuania, followed by boat one, which is Lavik Salferaining from Norway. So uh, very, very close racing. And we've seen a lot of place changes down the final run. So uh, these, boats, these boats aren't secure yet. The, the one with the most to lose is the third place Huvix Boat Club in boat number two with the red sails in a good defensive position on the pink boat, Sailing Club Nauticus from Lithuania, though. And then just look at the gaps to first and second. Yacht uh, Regatta Club Bodensee from Switzerland onto Port Jibe and really stretching their legs away from the rest of the pack right now. The team, skipper by Massimo Soriano, with the crew, Tobias Rudlinger, René Oat, and Stefan Zurflu. Doing Regatta Club Bodensee proud and showing that they can sail on the open sea as well as on the lake, the Bodensee Lake that they're used to sailing on normally. All look so straightforward as they sail the final few meters down to the committee boat and across the finish line. One of the most comfortable leads we've seen all day. And um, nothing very remarkable about their race. It's just it, it, very straightforward. I suspect if we did the analysis on that race, they probably would have done the fewest maneuvers or amongst the boats with the fewest maneuvers. High five. And nice way to finish the afternoon for the Swiss. So oh, yeah. You. Got all the high fives in. That's good. Nearly missed the last one. Across the finish line come Circolo della Vellabari. It uh, looked close for them at times. It looked a little bit dangerous at the windward mark. It looked like they were going to come into that windward mark with no rights, but they somehow managed to get around in fourth or fifth. And somewhere down that first run managed to get their way up into second or third place so good consistency good ability to chip away one boat at a time across the line in third place the third Swedish boat of the uh, three Swedish crews here Huvix Boat Club coming across in third place followed by the only Lithuanian team Sailing Club Nauticus but it's a photo finish with the Dutch so hard to say who's come out on top between Lithuania and the Netherlands and then coming across for sixth place in this race Lavik Selferaining from Norway <coughs> somewhere at the back that's Lavik there we're looking at they come across in sixth and then in seventh will be the Polish Odyssey Sailing Club and then the French won't sail across the finish line 
they were already pulled out of the race. Societe de Regat du Havre were over the line early and weren't permitted to finish the race. So, uh, flight 13, race three. Straightforward win for Regatta Club Bodensee, but that's not been the typical run of play today, has it, Corky? I mean, we've, we've seen typically very tight races and uh the, okay so the leader gets away quite often but it was quite a comfortable second place for italy we don't often see that no a lot of, a lot of the time there's been that big bundle towards the uh uh windward mark that first windward mark is generally where it really sort of shatters out that race course uh the mistakes come in people try and push a little bit more but um yeah that's uh been a mixed bag and again it's all about keeping it clean um you know, Odyssey Sailing Club uh, just going across the line now to uh, complete this race. To say the French headed home for early showers after that OCS in that last race, and that uh, rounds up uh, flight 13. So um, some uh, some great racing, but again, it just shows how uh, the level of the sailing in the one design boats all being pushed on a short race course. You've not got a, ma a huge amount to manoeuvre, and that's why they can pack so quickly at that windward mark that a uh, mistake creeps in at that point, and um, that can suddenly shake up your whole race course pretty quickly. So we saw the top two teams in the regatta competing in that race, um, but it's still Cercolo della Velabari, um, and we'll go to the leaderboard now, and you can see it for yourself. Cercolo della Velabari um, from Italy, got a second in that race and Regatta Club Bodensee got a first in that race but it's the Italians that are still first overall with 30 points Regatta Club Bodensee their first place lifts them to within two points of the overall lead followed by Varian Seglerhaus and Vanzi um, got a first and then and then a sixth place we uh, we spoke to their Helmsman Tim just now, not too concerned about the sixth and uh, third place, still very respectable for them. Let's just trickle down to seventh place. So holding that seventh qualifying spot, remember it's only the top seven go through, it's Austria's Yacht Club Breitenbrunn. So despite the OCS disqualification earlier, just holding on to a qualifying place and then breathing down their next one place outside qualifying is the Dutch RR and ZV Massenroer. A bit of a uh, a sort of a ho-hum day for them and a last place in flight 12 not what they wanted but they're still very much in the fight for qualifying as are the Estonians Eastie, Match Race and Leeds just two points off seventh place and the fast improving Czech Republic truck JK Poulsen won won three from their last three races 53 points just four points off qualifying so that is a possibility for them. And the Swedes, Saro Boat Club, two second places. Well, if they can get two more second places tomorrow, maybe they could squeeze through into the top seven. And then it's a bit of a gap uh, back to Wessex Exile Sailing Club from Great Britain. A seventh place in their last race of the day. That gives them a mountain to climb, bearing in mind that we've only got two flights of racing tomorrow. We've got a poor forecast. We've got... Um, the possibility of rain and, and uh, that could affect the racing tomorrow. But uh, two, two more races for them to be able to redeem themselves. Then going further down, we've got uh, the Dutch R KNZ and RV Muiden. They have their moments. They got a second place yesterday, but uh, not bad today. A, a, a five four three five, but not quite enough to get them into qualifying position where you need to be sort of averaging a little bit better than... Um, third and fourth place in all the races to be able to go through to San Moritz later on this year. So, Corky, um, it, it's been pretty fast, efficient turnaround of racing today. We've had the breeze to do it. We haven't had the sunshine, so it's not the typical blue skies and blue water that we see for Porto Cervo. Um, so the, the weather is a little bit unusual, but the racing has still been very solid today. Yeah, no, I think that's how, how the format works. You, you've mentioned several times uh, Matilda being out there, which is the base for all the sailors. Uh, the ribs, you know, the teams are all there. The rotation's already. It allows uh, everyone to be in place, set up, next team's ready, and that's where we, we instantly go to those onboard cameras and you just see Bedlam as four sailors are climbing off, four sailors uh, 
uh, are coming back and um, they just literally jump from one boat to another, put their team uh, flag on the back of the boat and bang, we're into racing. And so uh, quick turnaround, quick racing. And uh, again, full credit to um, the race committee, 39 races completed. Uh, we talk about flight numbers. Well, we're, we're flight 13, but that's 39 races completed. You know, that's, that's uh, incredible. That's, that's in, quite <laughs> in three days. That's that's pretty darn good. Um, so we wrap up the end of uh, day three of the One Oceans Sailing Champions League qualifier here in Portocevo. Uh, One Oceans being in relation to the One Oceans Foundation, something set up by Yacht Club Costa Smeralda to draw greater attention uh, to the need to, to look after our oceans um, and uh, a reminder that there, are, there is no uh, planet B. We've only got planet A to live on. Um, if you want to run back through the races and uh, maybe uh, you're related or you're, you're friends with uh, one of the sailors, maybe you're from one of the 24 sailing clubs represented here, um, you can check it all out on sapsailing.com. You can rewind the races and, and run through them at different speeds. You can look at the the number of maneuvers, the average speed of the boats. Um, I've seen some of the sailors using it when they've been on board the good ship Matilda to, uh, to review their own racing and tactics. You can do the same and decide if your club is, is doing well or if there's a message you want to send them overnight and tell them to focus on doing fewer maneuvers and, and just sail the J70 faster through the water. I'm sure they'll appreciate that. You can also watch the racing uh, back on YouTube. So look for the Sailing Champions League channel on YouTube, on Facebook, all the usual channels. Um, we will be back for racing the final two flights at 11 o'clock tomorrow morning from Mark Corky Roads, from myself, Andy Rice. We hope you've enjoyed today's racing. Join us for the final two flights tomorrow. <laughs>